Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Agriculture Research Services third webinar, Migration, Diagnostics, and ATA. This is the third webinar out of a five-part webinar series. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen, there's questions and an answers function, the Q&A box. Please use this function to ask any of the speakers questions. The speakers can either answer your questions live verbally or type their answers. You may also use, this, use the Q&A box for technical questions about Zoom functionality. Here's today's program. A link to the agenda and our website with upcoming webinars will be sent to the chat to start it. To start us off, I will introduce Dr. Roxanne Matroni. Dr. Matroni is with the Office of National Programs at the Agricultural Research Service. She has been with ARS for five years and is currently a national program leader for animal health. Dr. Matroni oversees AMR and alternatives to antibiotics research associated with the animal health program and serves on the national and international interagency groups focused on AMR, including the Transatlantic Task Force on Antimicrobial Resistance the President's Advisory Council for Combating Antibiotic Resistance Bacteria. I'll pass it on to you, Dr. Matroni. Thank you, Sophie. Welcome, good morning and good afternoon. We are pleased to have over 216 registrants from 37 countries for the third of five antimicrobial resistant and alternative to antibiotics research webinars presented by the USDA Agricultural Research Service. As the USDA's in-house non-regulatory research agency, the ARS conducts research to address agricultural issues of high national priority and identify solutions to AMR risks associated with agriculture. As an agricultural research organization, ARS is uniquely positioned to identify AMR solutions to promote animal, plant, environmental, and public health while sustaining agriculture. Antimicrobial resistance research is an important part of our four national program areas, animal production and protection, crop production and protection, natural resources and sustainable agricultural systems, and nutrition, food safety, and quality. ARS has a strong track record of solution-oriented, hypothesis-driven research that delivers innovative and sustainable solutions. Using a breadth of inter internal and external expertise, ARS hosted a research solutions for AMR workshop last year to build on existing research and formulate a cohesive ARS strategy to identify AMR and ATA solutions for agriculture. Teams of scientists heard from key stakeholders and leaders in the field of AMR and ATA research about the state of the science and to identify industry and regulatory priorities on AMR research in agriculture. This strategy clarified our vision to be the global leader for innovative, equitable, sustainable research solutions for AMR in agriculture and our mission to promote the resilience of agriculture to AMR for the health and safety of animals, plants, environment, and the public through cutting edge research solutions and outreach. The development of this strategy also identified research needs that will advance the science and develop solutions in five priority areas, risk, systems biology and detection, mitigation, and communication. Over the next few months, ARS will present webinars highlighting ongoing research on these topics. Today's session will focus on the priority topic of mitigation and specifically the development of alternatives to antibiotics. Speakers will discuss the development of novel intervention strategies to optimize antibiotic use or reduce AMR transmission across the One Health spectrum. This will be followed by a question and answer session in which we will, we will be happy to take your questions and a panel discussion with the speakers. We thank you for being here and look forward to the panel discussion after the talks. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the day, Dr. Lonnie King, Professor and Dean Emeritus at the College of Veterinary Medicine from The, o the Ohio State University. Dr. King has served in a number of academic and public positions, including serving as Dean for three colleges, three veterinary colleges, and Director of the National Center for Zoonotic Vector-Borne and Enteric Diseases at the CDC. He has also served as the Administrator and Chief Veterinary Officer at APHIS. 
Dr. King was elected as a member of the National Academy of Medicine um, of the National Academies of Science in 2004. He's a past vice chair of the National Academies of Medicine's Forum on Microbial Threats to Health. He just completed a seven year assignment as the vice chair for the President's Advisory Council Combating Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria, or PACCARB. We are honored that he is here today with us. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. King. Dr. McTorney, thank you very much. And good morning, everybody. Appreciate the opening remarks and also the kind introduction. So I thought it might be helpful today since we have a pretty diverse audience and, and a global one to, might, uh, to add a little bit of a backdrop to our uh, presentations today. Uh, and also to highlight the importance of the research that you're going to hear about in a few minutes. The federal government uh, began a serious a a AMR program in 2015, uh, but leading up to this time, antimicrobial resistance was termed the silent global pandemic, threatening the health and well being of people, of animals, plants, and the environment. A real concern was expressed at that time that a without a significant and effective interventions, we could possibly find ourselves in a post-antibiotic world that would set medicine, public health, and agriculture back decades. So in 2015, the Council of Advisors for Science and Technology to the White House issued a call to action, and that was immediately followed by a presidential executive order that issued by President Obama at that time, ordering the formation of a federal task force. And that task force was co-chaired by secretaries of Health and Human Services, Department of Defense, and the US Department of Agriculture. And it was up to them then to create a national action plan to combat resistant bacteria. At the same time, the President's Advisory Council to combat antimicrobial resistant bacteria was also formed and put in place. And th they were uh, charged to help support and advise the task force and the federal agencies. A, a White House meeting was then held to kind of launch and kick off all of these initiatives. The National Action Plan to Combating Antimicrobial Resistant Bacteria was soon launched, establishing a five-year plan uh, that involved the coordination of all federal agencies involved with any aspect of AMR. That blueprint then emphasized five critical strategies. And those were stewardship, um, surveillance, diagnostics, research and development, and global collaboration. That five-year plan then was put into action with specific goals and, and tactics. A lot was completed and accomplished during those five years. We are now in the second five years from 2020 to 2025, but we're using the same five uh, major categories um, to kind of coordinate the national activities. So in addition to these key activities uh, to try to eliminate antimicrobial resistance. The National Action Plan emphasized the use of a synthesizing framework to both better understand the complex dynamics of AMR and to focus on the most effective intervention strategies. That framework, as you know, is One Health. It's now really, I think, accepted uh, internationally and uh, the quintessential uh, issue in One Health is really antimicrobial resistance. It's been adopted by the G7, the G20, the United Nations, most international agencies, and also um, a strategy that synthesizes the effort in almost all national plans across, across the world. Thus, USDA, animal plant and agriculture and environmental science, I think have appropriately been elevated and central to the success of a national act, action plan and the sustainability and the resilience of agriculture through its efforts to combat antimicrobial resistance, promote and optimize health across the One Health domains in human, animal, plant, crop, and environmental health. 
So as you heard, USDA IRS held a workshop last year identifying the five research priorities that um, uh, Dr. Bertrani just uh, discussed with you. These are critical programs and tactics that are linked specifically to the National Action Plan major goals. In particular, our conversation today about mitigation and, and, and alternatives to antimicrobials relate directly to the goal of stewardship, of conducting more R&D and innovation and new strategies, whether that's for new antibiotics, diagnostics, or especially alternatives to agriculture. It also has to do, I think, with, um, with diagnostics as we delve into this further. So the ARS priority things, the basis of these uh, webinars are directly connected and linked to the success of the National Action Plan. So today we'll drill down into some of the specific and exciting research studies and findings that highlight important mitigation strategies to reduce or eliminate AMR. The emphasis will be on finding alternatives to the use of antimicrobials. This is an emerging research area with great relevance uh, to the AMR challenge and certainly with local, state, national, and even global implications. Mitigation is a focus on novel interventions and innovations to optimize the use of antimicrobials and or reduce the transmission of resistant organisms and mobile genetic material. So with that as a backdrop, let me uh, again reiterate, it's a pleasure for me to uh, moderate this webinar today and uh, a further pleasure to introduce a group of really outstanding ARS scientists and researchers who will share their work and highlight some exciting findings that will lead to AMR mitigation. So before we start, just as a reminder, questions are encouraged and you can put those uh, into the, the Q&A section uh, at your screen and we will try to answer those either uh, live or researchers will try to respond to you um, directly. Uh, the bulk of our questions and answers then will actually be reserved to a final session after our three panels today that we will engage in a 40 or 40, 50 minute rich discussion about the findings and questions that you might have. Uh, after the three panels and before that discussion, we will plan on taking a, a short break. So um, let's, uh, let's get started. And uh, I will introduce the first panel. The topic of the first panel was novel antimicrobials for dairy pathogens. Let me introduce the two panelists. First is Dr. Hart, Billy Hart Cooper, a research chemist specializing in biometric um, self-assembly and green chemistry in the bioproducts research unit at the Western Regional Research Center of the USDA ARS. Uh, that's in Albany, California. He works with industry, academia to develop alternatives to persistent chemicals and packaging. And his research has been featured in the American Chemical Society, the Chemical and Engineering News, e, e News, and also the PBS NewsHour. Uh, presenting with uh, uh, Dr. Hart Cooper will be Dr. Jennifer Wilson Weldon. Dr. Jenny Wilson is a research microbiologist at the USDA National Animal Disease Center in Ames, Iowa, studying the pathogenesis and host immune response to spirochete diseases in cattle. Her current research at the USDA focuses on all things dealing with smelly hooves. So, so Jenny, that's be quite a business card, I think, <laughs> that, that you must have, including treponome pathogenesis, model development, immune response to chronic infection, vaccine development, and novel alternatives to antibiotics for treatments. She's a PhD in veterinary microbiology and preventive medicine at, from Iowa State and has worked with the USDA at NADC for about 10 years. So uh, greetings to you both. And um, Dr. Hart Cooper, do you wanna go ahead and get started? Yes, uh, thanks very much, Dr. King. Um, I think uh, Dr. Wilson Welder is gonna uh, share slides. Um, so I'm, I'm Billy Hart Cooper, super excited to be here today. It, with my collaborator, Dr. Wilson Welder, and we're gonna share our approach to developing new antibiotic alternatives. 
Uh, next slide, please. So I started on this project a number of years ago. And um, as many of us know, antimicrobials are essential for modern life. They really form the foundation of our food safety system and our medical systems. You can't have surgery without antibiotics, for example. But antimicrobials have some general problems. They're very toxic to microbes. Um, but they also have off-target toxicity issues, both to humans and the environment. And they can be persistent. When they linger in the environment, they can cause antibiotic resistance to uh, other organisms and cause it to develop in environmental microbes. And that can transfer then to uh, microbes that are pathogenic to humans. So we wanna develop safer antimicrobials that uh, hit their target and then don't cause any off-target effects, ideally. Very hard to do. Uh, so I started on this project trying to develop safer preservatives for home cleaning products. Most water-based home cleaning products have to have antimicrobials in them. Otherwise, microbes will get in, mold and bacteria will get in and grow, and it could make people sick when they use those products. So I started by collaborating with a company, a home and personal care company, to try to identify preservatives for the products that would be very safe for skin and safer for the environment. I screened hundreds of different chemicals and tested their ability to inhibit bacterial and mold growth. From those results, I was able to identify what chemical features caused broad spectrum activity and good performance at inhibiting the growth of all those microbes, broad spectrum activity. But one problem that we ran into is every single chemical functionality with its potency, it brought some sort of hazard. And that was kind of unique to the chemical function. Now, for example, I've, I've highlighted a quaternary ammonium compound shown here. Now, those are very effective antimicrobials, but they have issues around um, their ecological toxicity. They can be toxic to aquatic organisms, especially small invertebrates and fish. Um, and they tend to persist in the natural environment. Um, they can biodegrade, but under natural conditions, it's, it's a little bit questionable. And Probably the, the worst part of it is that once they get in the environment, they can cause generalized forms of antibiotic resistance to develop um, that translate to clinically important antibiotics. So by using these chemicals for say disinfectant sprays or as conditioning agents for your hair, um, they could transfer at the end of their life once you're done using it to creating more antibiotic resistance. Uh, next slide, please. So it led to the central question of how do we separate the performance? How do we keep the potency of antimicrobials as a general class and minimize the threats of hazard to uh, environmental organisms and hazards to human health, as well as the potential to develop antibiotic resistance? So our novel approach was to identify two different subcomponents, use the power of uh, self-assembly, molecular self-assembly, identify two different non-toxic subcomponents that by themselves are not active antimicrobials when they're in the presence of one another, they link up in a reversible way to form compound C. So you go from A, B to C. Um, you use the compound, it's highly effective, it hits its target, it does what it needs to do. And then once it's washed out in the wastewater, water will drive apart that bond that links together A and B. So you go back to the non-toxic subcomponents that are then biodegradable. So you minimize the persistence in the environment by creating this new mechanism uh, where water can break it apart kind of works with nature, works with water in that way. Uh, next slide, please. And so as a chemist, what type of bond would enable this type of, of activity? We focused in on the hydrozone bond. It's formed by condensation between an aldehyde or ketone, more often an aldehyde, and a hydrazine derivative. Now, the way this scheme works is that the aldehyde and the hydrazine derivative are by themselves inactive. In the presence of one another, they self-assemble to a hydrozone that's highly active, highly potent, and then that can be reversed back, and it automatically and passively is reversed back when it's diluted past a certain concentration. Now, that's represented um, by an association constant. That's the Ka there, 10 to the 6 per molar. What does that mean? Uh, next slide, please. So when so you, have you have a Ka, an association constant of about 10 to the 6, what that implies is that um, that bond is strong enough at a certain concentration so that if you had 1% of that material in a one liter bottle of say laundry detergent, you would have 99% of, of the chemical as that hydrozone, as the active compound. So you'd have it when you need it. And then you'd have less than 1% of the dissociation. So it's all in equilibrium. 
But if you were to take that product bottle, dump it into a 25 meter swimming pool, that dilutes it a lot. And once it reaches a, what's called the thermodynamic equilibrium, uh, you have over 90% dissociated. You have 90% back to the non-toxic aldehyde and hydrazine derivative. Um, and as it gets diluted more and more, as it would in the natural environment, it becomes totally deactivated back to the non-toxic subcomponents. Um, this bond is also strong enough that it allows uh, you to achieve similar potency as typical antibiotics. So you can dilute the chemical down to uh, PPM uh, levels and still get activity. But when you dilute it below that level, uh, it loses activity, becomes dissociated. Next slide, please. So how do you actually do this in real life? Well, we screened lots of different combinations, hundreds, and we identified one combination that worked pretty well. It's composed of cumin aldehyde. That's the chemical shown on the left. It's a natural component from cumin seed oil, major component there. Uh, food grade compound, a lot of us eat it every day. It's the, it's the familiar smell and flavor of tacos and taco seasoning, cumin. The, it's a natural compound. The, the second compound we identified, it's a synthetic compound. It's called amino guanidine. It's had extensive human testing. It's been investigated as a pharmaceutical, as a treatment for diabetes. Um, and so it's been through phase two clinical trials where uh, cl close to 700 participants consumed large quantities of this substance um, on a daily basis over the course of years with low or minimal side effects. So we reasoned that if we use it at a much lower level and it's not even being consumed, it should be fairly safe for both human and animal use. Another important part of this substance, it's virtually non-toxic to many different aquatic organisms. Um, and a lot of the organisms that it's tested on, and it's biodegrades. Once it goes in the wastewater, it's already been reported that it breaks down with a half-life of about a month. Now, when these two substances are in the presence of one another, um, they self-assemble to the active compound, the, what we call the cuminaldehyde guanyl hydrosome. Now, we've done testing and, and shown that it's non-irritating or sensitizing to skin at order of magnitude higher concentrations than you need for performance, and it's non-volatile because of the positive charge. It keeps it from um, evaporating in the air, keeps people from breathing it um, under, under standard conditions. And uh, the mechanisms of these compounds are known. And structurally, they're similar to known antimicrobials, except they have that unique feature, that reversible bond that's pointed to. Uh, next slide, please. Question is, that we wanna ask then is how fast it's dissociation. It's not instantaneous with the hydrozone bond. Uh, and so we, I went ahead and measured the dissociation rates at various pHs because uh, water can be high pH, low pH, neutral pH in the natural environment. Uh, and so you wanna understand how pH might affect it. And uh, what we learned was the half-lives for dissociation, how quickly it breaks apart, varies from about a week to about to several months, ranging from like the more acidic end to uh, the more basic end of uh, typical water. That it would end up in. Um, and you see faster rates at lower pHs, so below pH 5. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and another interesting detail is that um, you see a large dependence on uh, of, uh, a large effect of pH on dissociation rate above pH 5 as you go from like 5 to 7. And below pH 5, uh, pH does not affect dissociation rate so much. All of those half-lives are on the order of about a week or two. Uh, next slide, please. The next question was, how quickly do the subcomponents break down? I mentioned that amino guanidine had previous research showing that it breaks down on about a month, but you always wanna verify these things with your own hands. So if you take the two subcomponents, subject them to, uh, I, I went to a reservoir, got a bunch of natural reservoir water, uh, put the chemicals in there, le measured, the conversion to carbon dioxide over time. Uh, what we observed is that human aldehyde degrades very rapidly, as you would expect with a natural non-toxic chemical with half-life of about 10 days in fresh water. Now, amino guanidine did not get fully converted to CO2 in the way that human aldehyde did. Um, and we think that is because it's forming a different product. It's not forming CO2 in the same way because when we do a similar experiment, put amino guanidine in water and monitor its disappearance, it goes away with a half-life of about, in our hands, about 38 days. So it was very close to the reported value of about 30 days. We reproduced that. So it breaks down. We don't know um, exactly what the mechanism is, but we're currently studying it. Um, and uh, as a control, 
conventional antimicrobials that are typically used, benzyl conium chloride, that's the typical quat disinfectant, did not break down over this time span. And that's consistent with a lot of literature showing under environmental conditions with mixtures of environmental organisms. Um, it does not break down for you know, tens to hundreds of days, or as long as the experiment is run. Similarly, the self-assembled compound by itself had very similar perform uh, performance to the benzyl conium chloride. It inhibited microbial respiration. If anything, you see less CO2 than you would expect if there was even 5% conversion. So they're active antimicrobials that inhibits biodegradation unless they're broken apart into their subcomponents. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so how does this, how do these compounds perform? So we tested these compounds in uh, commercial cleaning formulations. We did a control, the cleaning formulation without an antimicrobial, and then we did it with our antimicrobial at a very low level. We saw without an antimicrobial, when you spike in all these different microorganisms, this is part of preservative challenge testing, uh, you see those, many of those organisms, either their population stays stable, they persist in the, in the formula, or they even grow. That's what you see in the top graph. Now, in one case with Staph aureus, that organism was not viable in the cleaning solution. But in all the other cases, either the populations are stable or they grow. Uh, in the case of adding our antimicrobial, it knocks out all the bacteria and yeast. And in the case of mold, it causes over 99% reduction, lowers that level to a passable criteria for the test. And it stays that way for, we've done run the test up to 90 days. Works very well as a, as a preservative that's um, uh, less, less hazardous than traditional ones. Uh, next slide, please. Similarly, we observed that the time, the kill kinetics are very fast with this substance. Um, it eliminates gram-negative bacteria like Pseudomonas or E. coli uh, as quickly as quaternary ammonium compounds and bleach. And it doesn't have the adverse effects of, of many quaternary ammonium compounds and, and bleach. We've done a bunch of other tests and seen similar effects. So it acts quickly like a disinfectant, but it also acts in a broad spectrum way like a preservative. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other question is like, how do we fully describe that the potential hazards and toxicity of these compounds? And so I followed a, a general green screen cr like criteria where you analyze 16 to 18 different hazard endpoints. Is it carcinogenic? Is it mutagenic? Is it reproductive developmental toxin? Um, what is the acute toxicity? What is the threshold for skin irritation? What is the environmental toxicity? Analyzed all of those either by, through modeling, um, direct experiments that have been done, or by uh, extrapolating from known compounds that have similar functionalities. Now, the subcomponents have are very low hazard in general and uh, very low environmental toxicity, but they aren't very potent. A reversible compound, um, it has similar hazards in general to things like uh, quaternary ammonium compounds, um, the unique feature being that it breaks apart. So it, it causes less environmental toxicity because you're converting from one chemical, chemical that's highly potent to two that are way less potent. Um, we've uh, also completed skin irritation patch testing and observed no cases of skin irritation or sensitization uh, at uh, five to 10 times the yeast level. Now compared with conventional preservatives, those can cause allergic skin reactions at orders of magnitude lower concentrations in some cases and um, orders of magnitude higher environmental toxicity. So you get a tiny one one hundredth, one one thousandth of the concentration um, and uh, uh, of those traditional preservatives and disinfectants, and they can totally uh, kill a lot of aquatic organisms, persist in the environment, be felt and noticed um, by environmental microbes that can then develop antibiotic resistance. Uh, next slide, please. So based on that information, I'm, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Dr. <coughs> Mulder. Um, at that point, we had developed a broad spectrum you know, eliminates lots of different bacteria, mold, and yeast. Um, antimicrobial is safer skin. And so we wanted to examine whether it would be a good alternative to antibiotics for things like skin or hoof infections. So, so yeah, this is about the time where, where, where I came into the project um, because we still do need antimicrobials and antibiotics for treating animal disease. So this is kind of a, an older picture, but this is an overview of the center where I work. That's uh, I-35 there going through uh, central Iowa. It's a 500 acre facility. And it's kind of unique in that it's only one of a, you know, less than a dozen in the world that's dedicated to animal disease, uh, not necessarily production, but just focused on, on animal disease. So the disease I work on, digital dermatitis, uh, affects uh, cattle in 
all kinds of housing types of conditions. You can see it's a pretty extreme case there. It's a polymicrobial bacterial infection at the skin uh, hoof junction. It can occur mostly on the back of the hind feet, but it can occur you know, on the front feet or around the dew claw. Uh, treponemes are the major bacteria at the leading edge of the lesions, but we know that there's a lot of different factors involved in this. And it causes, uh, it's leading cause of infectious lameness around the globe. It affects both dairy and feedlot cattle. And it's really a problem because it's affecting these animals kind of at that late harvest stage where they really don't have a chance to make up that lost weight. Uh, estimates of uh, cost it was over $300 per incident. You think that's not very much, but when you consider, you know, 60 to 80% of a, a herd or a pen can be affected, it can be affected multiple times and in multiple feet. Uh, that adds up pretty quick. Uh, you know, lost production, prevention, uh, even leading to some early culling decisions. As it, uh, we know that it can affect uh, not just cattle, but it can affect sheep and goats. We don't see a lot of it in the United States, but we do uh, globally. And once you have have these organisms on your farm, um, they can cause a lot of other problems. These are other hoof diseases, uh, some soul abscesses and some white line disease. They have been infected with the, the uh, digital dermatitis bacterium, and they just make a, a, a bad situation worse and make it much more intractable. Uh, the middle picture there is uh, utter cleft rot or an utter lesion, again, infected with the treponemes. And because of that expansion of that, Utter skin. There's cases of this in uh, in zoological parks with European bison, uh, Mediterranean buffalo, is where you get buffalo milk mozzarella from. Um, they've got it in the Pacific Northwest. We have a problem with in wild elk. As far as treatment goes, um, there's nearly no good one. There's because of polymicrobial disease. There's no real vaccine. Best treatment is touch. A lot of people have stopped using this. Uh, not only with the veterinary feed directive, increased bulk tickling is just a no-go for a lot of producers now. Uh, you can have some chelated copper sprays. Um, again, not widely used, not widely available in the United States. And that leads to a lot of uh, home remedies, different pastes and things that people mix up. Again, not regulated and very, very, very different on the effectiveness. Prevention is, is mostly uh, controlled through foot baths, copper sulfate, zinc sulfate formalin. Um, yeah, a lot of different uh, human health and environmental health hazard with these. And even though they're not antibiotics themselves, they can cause uh, increase in antimicrobial resistance because the genes that regulate heavy metal uh, resistance are often on the same linkage as traditional antibiotics. So Billy sent me a, a library of compounds and uh, them against organisms. Uh, you can kind of see what you want is a short bar. You want that highest has uh, some compounds that work broad spectrum uh, against both the, the, the spirochetes, um, anaerobic bacteria, and uh, gram-positive and gram-negative. Uh, anaerobes a little bit different metabolically, so uh, it was important to, to kind of rerun some of these tests. And what we got from this was, you know, one side of this, the, the thing. Now we know the minimum amount that we need to put into some sort of a, of a uh, treatment to kill the broad spectrum of, of organism. The second test that we ran in vitro was, uh, I would love to, it's, it's cheap, it's great. It works in swing pools, but um, you know, about third time a cow walks through a, a bleach bath and, and poops, it's no good. So, uh, <laughs> 
We took and made some sterile powdered dairy manure. My tech love that one and, uh, of the reversible biocides and we ran our, our tests again. Um, and as you can see, no growth. That's uh, good. Uh, red plus mark, uh, you know, that decreased the efficacy of our, our biocide. So again, a few more knocked off the list. They just didn't work in presence of high organic matter. So now we're down to just a few compounds that we're, we're kind of checking all the boxes, working at a low concentration, working in the presence of organic matter. And uh, I felt we were, we had some things that I was pretty comfortable going forward with a, uh, an animal trial on. So we started with thing that my producers can use. And when you look at cattle trimming shoots, some of them are sideways, some of them hold the feet up behind the animal. So we need something that could be applied with a, a caulking gun upside down. And so a bomb worked really great. And Billy and his team really hit this one out of the park. Uh, it had to uh, work over a wide temperature range, um, be compatible with the biocide, but be compatible with uh, a braided wounded skin, and then work over a wide temperature range. And that's the uh, daily temperature high for uh, the first year that we trialed them. And we went from you know 100 degrees to an early snowfall. And this stuff remained pliable. It didn't separate. Um, it was just just beautiful. And the most expensive thing in it was the beeswax. So that is just absolutely amazing. So uh, so we have a, a great bomb. We had our component. And my eye cuck said, you're going to test this on intact skin first, right? So <laughs> they absolutely did that. And so what we have is we did that. Uh, there's even though these things, uh, uh, even though we knew that these things were non-toxic on human skin, uh, animal skin is very different uh, as far as sebaceous glands, number of hair follicles, all of those things. So in this case, sheep were really um, a good model because sheep skin is very thin, uh, especially compared to human skin. And sheep are very, very sensitive to their skin. So again, following the human uh, insult, uh, repeat insult test, we applied the, the bomb for five days in a row. And what we saw was that a little bit of irritation after five days. We were applying the, the active ingredient at 100 times what our MIC was. So this is way, way above what is actually needed for microbial ki killing. Um, and that was intentional because we wanted to know, okay, how high a dose can we go? Usually you put the, the amount, your active ingredient is limited by cost, but, but here that wasn't an option. So, um, it, we, so now we got the other end of the bookend. We got, you know, the maximum amount the animal will take and we have, you know, what we need for what the, uh, the, the killing is. We kind of settled right around 1.5%. And went forward with our uh, our animal test. Uh, there we go. And we used uh, my uh, sheep model for digital dermatitis. Uh, we know sheep are susceptible. Uh, they create a great model, um, very cost effective at our center because they're secondhand sheep. And uh, what we can do is we can keep these guys in a nice, dry, uh, highly bedded, uh, deep bedded environment compared to some of the calf models. And we can get these reproducible lesions um, in, a, in about you know, three to four weeks. And we've got lots of different data showing that our input is our output. And, uh, um, and we've done a lot of work really, really showing this model. And I can talk more about it uh, at the uh, MP103 seminar next uh, later this week. Uh, for the sake of time, just yeah, briefly, it's a, uh, we lightly uh, uh, damage the skin, wrap it in wet bandages uh, in full tape and apply our uh, lesion material. And then those bacteria uh, proliferate, start your, you know, delving into that skin and we develop lesions in, in three to four weeks. 
Then we applied our treatment three times, replacing it with clean, fresh bandages each time, and then evaluated the, the effect of, of healing or those results um, at, all during that time. Uh, so I always put this in because um, I think it's kind of important. You know, the full time that these animals are on study, uh, they're getting pain medication for uh, lameness to help alleviate some of that that uh, lameness associated with that. And you know, peeling forty sheep every day is is you know it's a chore. It's not pleasant. And we heard in the seminar about putting pain medication in pig newtons. And we're like. Oh man, it's gonna take forever to get 40 sheep to eat cookies, but actually um, they caught on pretty quickly and we were able to color code the sheep um, and they kind of started looking forward to it and we started looking forward to it and it just really changed the whole outcome of the situation. And so I would encourage people that are doing animal studies to look for ways to, to get the animals buy-in um, and Get them to help participating, whether it's you know using Oreo cookies to weigh pigs or yeah, big Newtons for for sheep meds. Uh, we used them this year to help train them to come into the chute to get weighed and get their temperatures taken and stuff. So um, just think about ways that you can do things better, even if it just takes just an extra five minutes a day. Uh, eventually, it's going to save you time and headache in the long run. Uh, so here's it. The results, this is what everybody wants to know, did it work? Um, if we don't do anything, we just change the bandages on the on the feet. Um, they get a little bit better, but not really. They're not gonna completely resolve on their own. Uh, where we applied our balm, <laughs> it was absolutely amazing. It, uh, it was the reason why we call it miracle cream around here. Uh, within one to two treatments, we go from that horribly uh, irritated, um, you know, ulcerated skin to new pink fresh shiny skin here it is in a graphical form this is the percentage of feet in a treatment group if we do nothing majority of them get worse uh, with treatment a a majority of them resolved um, within the two to three treatments uh, all the rest of them showed improvements this was a trial where we tried a combination therapy uh, I don't think there was any additive effect. I think we just saw a dilution effect of, of the, the main component. Uh, we tried a second compound. Um, it didn't work quite as great as, as our first, our main treatment day there. So second year, we wanted to do a head-to-head -head with uh, common treatments. So we used oxytetracycline. That's what we could get uh, for the antibiotic. But we can't use copper sulfate in sheep. Sheep are very sensitive to copper. Um, that was just a disaster. So uh, we also decided that, uh, you know, we're always trying to refine the model. We found that we really needed a, a scoring system. So we made one built off of the ICAR cattle uh, claw atlas, uh, where each region has a, a, a point. And so you can add up the points and get a, a numerical severity score rather than just, oh yeah, it looks better or worse than the picture before. Again, looking at, at two of the compounds, one of them we increased because we went back and saw it didn't quite have as much severity uh, in the irritation test. The other one, we dropped the, the percentage down just a little bit, but again, cost was not our driving factor in changing the amount of the compound. Um, and again, you can see there in the graph, uh, the uh, our biocide treatment was just as effective as the antibiotic treatment. Uh, resolving majority of the lesions in, in one treatment. Uh, by two treatments, everybody had healed up. And so we were really, really excited about this. Um, at Cliff Trowing this last spring, we had one dairy cow in our, our facility that had a, a digital dermatitis lesion. We were able to try it on a, on a real cow lesion. And you can see with three days and a light bandage, um, that lesion is pretty much healed up. Um, just a little bit of residual there left. Um, it wasn't very cooperative, so we've decided we're going to let the foot bath heal that up. Other places that we've uh, been using this miracle cream, uh, utter lesions. We've had several of them in our uh, dairy facility on our research cows. We've had three different cows, and we've been able to take these these huge lesions. Uh, that's half inch marking tape there on the the pictures. 
uh, been able to take all of those lesions to complete resolution, um, applying the balm twice a week, um, usually three weeks to, to six to eight weeks, even with some of these really large lesions. And this is after these lesions have been treated with other traditional um, sprays and skin creams and even antibiotic paste, and uh, just nothing's, nothing was uh, resolving them. So I started going around the, the facility and saying, hey, who else wants to try this? And so uh, we looked at uh, the effect of these biocides on biofilms. Again, another place where everything is really uh, Traditional antibiotics and traditional cleaners and things have a hard time uh, penetrating that biofilm. We're using Manheimia and Staph aureus. Again, in a in an in vitro situation, growing a mature biofilm and then applying the biocides 30 minutes later, removing everything disrupting the biofilm and, and looking for growth. And several of our compounds at, at a very low percentage concentration um, have no problem with that, that biofilm um, killing all of the organisms. Um, the largest use of antibiotics on a dairy is actually mastitis treatments, um, intramammary treatments, and a lot of them are used at dry off. And so could we, you know, potentially use these for mastitis because it's the same thing. It's not always the same bacteria that's causing it. And if these can work broad spectrum, could they be used on mastitis? And so that's where we're kind of investigating now. Again, just like with the manure, it needs to be able to work in milk. Um, these things are shown to be very safe. Again, anything used in milk needs to be super safe because of uh, that being a, such an important food supply. And you can see from difference between the dark colored and the light colored bars, there's a little bit of difference between the efficacy of light of with or without milk in that growth media. Um, so, but we've got some that are, um, you know, fairly similar. There's no effect or um, Again, you want the small bars. So I think that there's a lot of promise, um, but again, this was just one part of the library. Billy said he's got more. Um, so I think that uh, we've got a good partnership and we can keep looking at these things and, and finding new uses for them. Um, so yeah, we, this has been a, a really great partnership. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential with diff different things um, and uh, you know, formulating them into different Because yeah, um, the, the the whole terrible thing about modern management is our animals are still going to get disease, and we still need ways to to combat that to keep them safe. So uh, Billy and I are the ones that presented it, but there's a whole raft of people behind us, uh, including our animals and the care team for them. So uh, that will take any questions. Well, thanks to you both. Um, a great example of. Uh, researchers in different areas from chemistry to microbiology coming together and creating an innovative biocide that has some real promise. So um, a, 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 great, uh, a great story. So we're running pretty close to getting started the second panel, but maybe just a quick question. Um, have you seen any acquired resistance to these biocides or have you used them long enough to tell? Um, so a collaborator has done some of those experiments with uh, pathogenic E. coli about uh, 30 or 40 different strains and observed over 30 different exposures uh, that no resistance was developed in terms of the inhibitory concentration. But there's other ways of looking at that question that, that um, we're still pursuing. Like for instance, you know, what genes are activated in the presence of, of the antimicrobial? So, so far, no obvious resistance, but it's, it's something we're still looking at. And I do think like it, any, any compound that's active will, will cause resistance. Okay, thanks again. Let's uh, move into our second panel. The topic of our second panel is a new strategy for controlling citrus screening disease, a model for combating AMR concerns in uh, crop disease management. So uh, let me introduce our two presenters uh, on this panel. The first is Dr. Robert Shatters, a research molecular biologist and research leader for the Subtropical Insects and Horticulture Research Unit at the U.S. Horticulture Research Laboratory in Fort Pierce, Florida. Received a PhD from Washington State University in Genetics and Cell Biology. He's been a research scientist with USDA ARS for 34 years 
where his research focus has been on applying molecular, cellular, and biotechnology approaches to real-world agriculture crop productions. His current work includes developing biologically-based solutions to emerging crop pest and pathogen issues, and to do so through the development of novel techniques that allow rapid deployment of genetic engineering solutions. Currently, he leads the USDA ARS Citrus Grand Challenge, and his co-leader, who I'll introduce next, is a team of, uh, from ARS, university and private sector scientists that have a $15 million USDA NEFA grant uh, in this area. Um, his partner in this um, research effort is Dr. Michelle Heck. Dr. Heck serves as a lead scientist and research molecular biologist with Emerging Pests and Pathogens Research Unit that is located in the Robert Hawley Center for Agriculture and Health uh, at the Cornell University campus in Ithaca, New York. Her research is focused on the discovery and characterization of insect vector plant pathogen interactions. Vector-borne diseases are some of the most challenging problems that we know in agriculture today. Dr. Heck is a proven leader with the ability to plan and conduct sophisticated experiments using a variety of molecular genetic and functional genomic methods to gain a deeper understanding of vector plant pathogens. Dr. Heck received a BA in biology from Boston University and her PhD in biology from the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. She's been working on research on protein interactions and protein transport in plants and insects for over 20 years. It's an international reputation and as an authority in vector biology and the management of vector-borne plant diseases. So Dr. Heck is co-lead with Dr. Shatters in this USDA ARS Citrus Screening Grand Challenge, and that's the agency's coordinated natural response to combat citrus greening disease. And that is a really serious problem that's really devastating the citrus in Florida and with potential problems in Texas, uh, as well as California. Dr. Shatters, do you wanna start please? Okay, so um, thank you all for being here today. My name is Dr. Michelle Heck, and I will be talking about the research uh, that we are doing uh, with the USDA ARS to develop a new control strategy for citrus screening disease. In our title, we have that this strategy is a model for combating AMR concerns in crop disease management. And typically when you hear you know, about a model system, you think something that's you know, highly simplified that you could derive some general principles and then apply it to other more complex systems. In this case, um, we have not been afforded the luxury to work these things out in a model system. Citrus screening disease, as we'll tell you, is one of the most highly complex, if not the most highly complex issue facing crop agriculture today in the United States. And so the story begins in Florida, sort of land of citrus and Mickey Mouse. Um, this is a very family friendly and wholesome image, only the situation is very serious for the citrus growing families in, um, in the state of Florida due to citrus greening disease, also referred to as Huanglong Bing or HLB as people abbreviate it. Citrus greening disease is caused by um, a gram negative bacterium that is spread throughout the groves by an insect vector. Um, so the disease is fatal in all varieties of citrus. And what you see here is a picture of an abandoned grove with you know, just rows and rows of dead trees in the grove um, that have, have died as a result of citrus green disease. And if you're in the state of Florida and you drive up and down the I-95 corridor, this is a um, sad, sadly familiar sight that you will see um, are all of these abandoned groves. This is a graph of citrus production in California and Florida. And you can see basically since the 1920s, um, the industry has you know, risen to meet the demand, risen to meet consumer demands with a few exceptions of some freezes and hurricanes that cause a blip in production, but the, the industry has always been able to respond and, and recover. And that is until the appearance of citrus greening disease in the state of Florida um, you can see here, as depicted by the gray line, in 2005, um, you know, the, the industry um, has just been in a sort of steep decline in terms of orange production ever since. 
So um, this disease has received national attention and um, the disease is now moving into commercial production areas in um, California and in Texas. Um, the state of Florida produces a lot of what the US consumers um, buy as the juice um, and the state of uh, California produces a lot of our fresh market citrus. And so, um, you know, with these industries in jeopardy, um, it really puts the availability of the U.S. supply of citrus um, in grave danger. So citrus screening disease, before we um, talk about the agency strategies that we're, we're working on, I just wanted to give you a little bit more background of, on the, the, the players involved in this um, disease. Um, system. So as I mentioned, this is an insect vector borne disease. The pathogen is referred to as uh, the pathogen in the United States is Candidatus liberobacter asiaticus, and we abbreviate this as CLAS for short. The insect vector is an invasive insect, Diaphrena citri, known as the Asian citrus psyllid is the common name. And all species of citrus are susceptible to citrus greeting disease. And the disease results when an insect feeds on an infected tree, completes its development, and then spreads the bacterium to a new uninfected tree. And in fact, the disease cycle can be spread even from local feeding sites in immature citrus tissue. Um, so you don't even need to have a fully infected tree. You could just have the development of infected populations of insects on these, um, these small, what we call flush points, which results in the rapid spread of this disease throughout a growth. And so I mentioned that this um, pathosystem is extremely challenging. And there are three major issues, um, three major challenges that have sort of come together to, to make this one of the most difficult diseases to approach in terms of you know, developing mitigation strategies. The first is that um, the bacteria are uncultivable. So any screening for novel compounds um, that would kill the citrus greening disease bacteria have to be conducted either using a surrogate bacterium or um, using the citrus greening bacterium in infected leaves or infected insects. The second problem is that the bacteria are insect transmitted. And so it, it's not enough to just sort of reduce the titer of the bacteria in the tree. You also have to impact the ability of the insect to spread the bacteria from tree to tree. And finally, um, the bacteria are localized within the plant's vascular system. And so this makes the delivery of therapeutics very complicated because you have to penetrate deep um, into the citrus tissues with any compound that's going to um, you know, fight the bacterium or, or kill the bacterium in the insect. And so with that, I will um, turn it over to Bob. And um, before I do though, I just wanna mention that um, when we started on this project, our motivation for developing a strategy is not just to develop new resistant trees. We really want to be able to allow citrus producers in Florida where the disease is heavily entrenched nearly 100% of the, the citrus growing counties are infected um, to salvage those diseased trees in the field. So can we you know, develop treatments that would have an impact on trees that are already infected in addition to preventing transmission and spread of this disease into, the, into other areas? And so with that, Bob, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so one of the first things we did to try to develop as a solution to the growers as quickly as possible was say, listen, there, there were two um, antibiotics that were being, have been used for over 50 years in, in crop production, fruit production, in um, especially palm fruits, uh, and that's oxytetracycline and streptomycin. And now those are being used on surface bacterial pathogens. So our question was, can we, can we manipulate the formulation to get it better uptake to get better uptake so we can have an effect on a phloem localized bacterium. And so we did a lot of greenhouse experiments where we were looking at, at, at commercially available adjuvants. Again, there's a quick urgent need. We weren't trying to develop anything new. We were screening everything that was currently available. And we were able to get better uptake with certain formulations. Um, we The industry was encouraged. We took it to the field and some trials. And uh, in, in production systems, 
we did see an improvement in yield. The, the graph on the right, these bars represent yield um, in several different trials that went on throughout Florida. And these trials included over 2 million commercial trees. Um, but that wasn't, we didn't cure it. Uh, the bacteria was still there um, and we weren't getting, uh, it was difficult to be able to get the growers to do the very strict things that need to be done to get this effective level. It was a compl complicated. So um, the success uh, was only temporary. Uh, we did get a crisis of, uh, declaration to allow it to be used. The growers used it and a lot of growers used it in a lot of different ways and some were seeing a good effect, some weren't. And of course, uh, if you could uh, advance, Michelle. Um, there were uh, other concerns as well. So it was it was costly. Um, we clearly uh, relied on multiple applications. We, we were looking at about at least three to six applications. Um, and these were foliar applications. We had to um, keep doing uh, resistance monitoring over the period of application time. Uh, disease, we needed specific adjuvants, and that was an issue with the growers. They they weren't uh, they would just use what they usually were using and weren't getting good effects. Um, and of course, the, the consumer concerns and scientific concerns over uh, that increased use of bactericides in, in an agricultural setting. So uh, that was really the starting point. Then we we said really for for the novel challenge requires novel solutions, right? And we said okay. Um, we not only need, so we need new therapeutics, but we need new delivery strategies as well. We showed that at least for the antibiotics, the topical method wasn't working. Um, and so what this, the rest of this talk will be about is uh, identifying how we are going about um, selecting or, or evaluating new therapeutic molecules, but also the development of a better delivery strategy to get these to the growers, not only to new trees, but to existing trees in the field. And the, the tech, we've looked, we are looking at both direct uh, injection or infusion and a new technology that Michelle and I, along with our collaborators developed that we call our symbiont technology. So um, there are a lot of molecules out there that we could test. Um, could you hit the next slide or the next, but really how do we deliver those to the grow? That was, that was the first hurdle. Before we could identify, we realized for biologics, we needed to have because they're costly to produce typically anyway, we needed to have a cost-effective way of producing them. And so next slide. Michelle will describe uh, our symbiont method that we developed. Okay, thanks, Bob. <laughs> so um, this is exciting for us to be able to present the sort of evolution of the work we've been doing. Um, so here we are now circa 19, uh, 2019, okay? <laughs> um, but we're gonna take a sort of step back into the 1970s um, first with the brief history of plant genetic engineering. And this is just to orient you to the basic biology that is behind the, the new delivery strategy, strategy we developed. Um, there is a soil dwelling bacterium called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. And if you've heard of, you know, transgenic plants, and probably all of you have heard of, you know, transgenic organisms, transgenic plants, Agrobacterium tumefaciens is the bacterium that is used by scientists to develop transgenic plant technology. And so um, this is a soil dwelling pathogen, actually, that is responsible for the development of what's called crown gall disease, okay, um, in, in plants. And crown gall disease is a serious pathogen and problem in many different crops. Um, and, and here's how the pathogen actually works. Um, the pathogen has a T plasmid, and within this plasmid, there's a tDNA. And um, back in 1977, Mary Del Chilton actually observed that um, agrobacterium transfers the tDNA portion um, of the plasmid into the plant genome. And she was the first to observe the tDNA in the plant nucleus, and this was very exciting. And within the tDNA are several genes that encode for the production of plant phytohormones that initiate cell division. And, and once the tDNA is transferred, this is how the bacterium induces a rapid proliferation of plant cells, um, which ultimately look like crown gall. And so what she and other, um, so actually, if you look back in her 1977 paper, um, she mentioned that agrobacterium are sort of the master genetic engineers and, and they, they 
represent a huge potential for the modulation of, of sort of plant genetic engineering. And, and she was right. And so what, what this sparked was actually a revolution in development of plant transgenic technology. And um, others, she and others showed, you can remove those gall forming phytohormone genes um, that initiate the cell division and the bacteria will still transfer the tDNA portion of the, the T plasmid into the plant genome. And so subsequently scientists showed you can add a gene of interest and this facilitates the generation of transgenic plants. Um, and so um, back in 2019, Bob and I had a series of interactions um, down in at the USDA headquarters. We were there for several different meetings together. And um, we posited, you know, could we look at agrobacterium and the power of what agro can do using a new lens? And so what we hypothesized was what if we added back those gall forming genes to the plasmid um, together with the gene of interest and developed a cluster of transgenic cells that would grow on the side of a plant and produce a therapeutic molecule. And this was just sort of a pie in the sky dream. And this is uh, what, it, what it might look like. So we create a plasmid with those gall forming genes plus a gene of interest. And this produces a tiny small group of transgenic cells that would fuse to the side of a plant just the way the agrobacterium, um, you know, the, the gall would form. So then we could remove this cluster of cells, um, which are partially transgenic, and transfer them into selective media with antibiotics to select for the transgenic cells, but also kill off the agrobacterium, which we no longer would need. These transgenic cells could then be transplanted back onto a plant. And at this point here, we call this new cluster of cells a symbiont. And we know that the symbiont is not what scientists would call a symbiont. This is a, a sort of, it, it, we designated this um, in partnership with our commercial um, partner to represent the beneficial nature of these cells to the host plant. So the symbiont then would continue to grow and divide infused with the vascular system of the plant producing beneficial molecules. And after several months of work, we got this working. This is a picture of a symbiont on the side of a citrus plant grown in the greenhouse. And this is a picture of a symbiont uh, growing on the side of a citrus tree. So Bob? Sure, thanks Michelle. So, so there's been a lot of work done on this over the last, uh, what, uh, 60, 70 years. Um, and they know, uh, we, and we just reevaluated what had already been known. And we see that when these form here, what you see on the left is a uh, very nascent developing, uh, in our case, symbiont, but a gall with agrobacterium. And those white streaks you see are the recruitment of vascular tissue. So these, these symbionts are very good at recruiting the vascular tissue into them to help support their growth. Um, and like what Michelle showed you is when the, one of the things that you know, we had to learn not being agrobacterium um, researchers to begin with is, you know, there's lots of variable interactions uh, the, between genotype by genotype interactions between the plant and the bacteria. And part of the key is finding the right bacterial strains or the right tDNA um, that, that provide, that forms the proper uh, type of symbiont. It doesn't grow too slow, grow, doesn't grow too fast and stays alive. But you'll see in that picture, uh, where it's this product of interest it being produced in the symbiont, entering the vascular tissue and moving systemically in the plant. Michelle? So, um, and here's an example of one that's producing uh, the green fluorescent protein. So you can see that bulge, this is again a nascent symbiont on a, on a stem of tomato. And you'll see that the green is, is, is extensive in the area of this developing symbiont, but you all still see it moving outward from that area. Uh, most of one of our air, heavy areas of, in, of research right now has been in improving export. And we've um, got some very interesting candidates that we're developing that help improve how that moves out of those cells. Can you, the next slide, those areas are pointing to that movement of the GFP. So again, I think what we really liked about this is having me being a, a transgenic plant kind of guy for the last 30 years and, and being frustrated with how difficult it is to get these out to the growers to use, I real, we realized that this, um, this is a, a plant treatment. We can treat existing trees in the grove um, and we don't need to spray. So it, 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 we modify one small portion of cells that grow. They don't move systemically. 
they stay right where they're at. Next. If they fall off, they die. These can't survive away from their host. They won't grow on any host. We believe it's about similar to grafting compatibility. We're evaluating further that, but that's what we're seeing. Um, and they can be established on trees in the field. And, and we're developing ways that this can be rapidly um, delivered to existing plants. And um, we're in negotiations right now with uh, EPA and APHIS on, on information they need to move this forward. Go ahead, Michelle. So that's the delivery strategy that we're very excited about and we're moving forward. Um, but now we have to deliver what do, we've got some, a way to deliver things. What do we deliver, Michelle? Okay, so for the past few years, my lab has been interested in looking for plant-derived sources of novel antimicrobial um, peptides. And so um, one of these areas of research comes from the legume um, plant family. In our case, we use Metacago truncatula. So legumes form a natural symbiosis with um, a different nitrogen fixing bacteria, in this case, Cyanorhizorbium melaloti, um, which is actually related to, uh, you know, to sea last phylogenetically. Um, and in the genome of Metacago are encoded these NCR peptides, which are nodule specific cysteine rich peptides. And the plant genome encodes these um, to help facilitate the symbiosis with these NCR peptides with this bacterium. And, and so during development of the symbiosis, these NCR peptides are used to regulate um, bacteroid differentiation and the growth of the symbiotic bacterium. Um, and so more than 10 years ago, researchers, other researchers showed that if you take these NCR peptides um, and express and, and deliver them in higher um, amounts, that you could actually kill a range of gram negative and gram positive pathogens. And so um, here you see um, a couple of different NCR peptides Here's NCR247 and NCR335 working to kill um, salmonella and listeria bacteria using, uh, you know, sort of different modes of action. And, and here's the sort of poly mix and B control. Um, and so our lab started to explore whether or not we could leverage the NCR peptide system for um, treatment of uh, citrus screening disease. And so we developed a project to first start screening in vitro against the culturable surrogate of Liberobacter asiaticus, Liberobacter crescens. Um, and there are approximately 600 NCR peptides that we could find in the Medicago genome. We whittled it down to about 185 that we could synthesize um, using FMOC synthesis. And then we screened these um, in, in plate assays against Liberobacter crescens, which we could grow um, in culture. And we narrowed it down to approximately 15 candidates that um, would, reduce the would reduce the growth of Liberobacter crescens in culture. And so from these 15 candidates, we then tested whether or not delivering them in infected leaves would have an impact on sea last titer um, in those infected citrus leaves or reduce transmission of the bacterium from those citrus leaves through the insect vector. Um, and so um, from there, we would take those promising candidates and then either express these through the symbiont or develop transgenic citrus plants to further evaluate them in the field. Um, and so from the 15, we then, as I mentioned, went to this sort of whole leaf assay. And um, here is a, a summary of about a year of work um, on this slide. The way that this assay works is we take uh, individual infected excised leaves and we place the, the nymph um, Asian citrusylid nymphs on these excised leaves. We deliver the NCR peptide um, to the leaf, to the, the sort of the cut end of the leaf. And this allows us to screen for two things. One, whether the peptide would have an impact on the acquisition of the bacteria by the insect, but also the ability of those peptides to move systemically through the plant's vascular tissue. You know, in culture, if there was an effect on Liberobacter crescens, that peptide might look effective, but because of its size or physiochemical properties, if it doesn't move through the plant's vascular system, it wouldn't be a good effective peptide for us to, to move forward for field evaluation. And so we allow these um, leaves with the insects to incubate for 21 days. And during this process of time, the insects molt into their adult stage and the bacteria replicate to high levels normally in the insect. And so by, um, by using this assay, we could test for those peptides which have an impact on the development of high titer insects. 
And this is a snapshot of what the data would look like from these assays with two effective peptides. And I'll sort of walk you through this. Um, this um, the KPO4 is the, is the control treatment. And the, on the y-axis is the CQ value or the qPCR value of the CLAS bacterium in the insect or the leaf. And with qPCR, um, the lower the number, the higher the titer of bacteria. So these very low values here indicate insects that have individual insects that have acquired uh, very high titers of bacteria. Um, and so um, this is the, the control treatment in the leaf and the, the control treatment in the insects. Um, you can see that, you know, through the normal course of the control, you have the development of these high titer insects. In two of these NCR peptides, you can see that the titer of the bacteria in the leaf are reduced. And subsequently, we can also prevent the development of these high titer insects, which is very exciting because those high titer insects are the ones that would go and spread the bacterium from tree to tree throughout the grove. Um, our positive control here is the polymyxin B, which um, we had shown um, to be sort of a, a useful control in these type of assays. And our NCR peptides actually work better um, than the polymyxin B control to, in preventing the development of high titer insects. Bob? Okay, so um, another part of trying to discover the molecules was deciding, could we use our symbionts in, in, in a kind of a efficient uh, screening strategy to rapidly evaluate potential antimicrobial molecules that we could produce either in our symbionts or, or in, in some in transgenic plants, however. And we came up with uh, a strategy where uh, if we identify the sequences of those um, genes that we want to test, we work, we've worked with uh, Codex DNA. They have a, a um, basically a bioprinter that allows us to, within five days, we submit them the sequences about 30, 40 times. Five days later, they send us a kit. We throw it on the machine. The next day, we have plasmids containing that, that contain our uh, sequences of interest that we then uh, put into agro and we put on, uh, on plants to get our, our symbionts produced. And we can then test those symbionts. They form in a matter of a few weeks. So um, we, can, we can kind of fairly rapidly test these in plants. As a matter of fact, as part of our grant that we have with um, um, our USDA and NEFA, uh, we've actually developed a, an education module with a, a collaborator from Indian River State College. It's here in Fort Pierce where I'm located. And we've developed this model that they can screen uh, bacteriocins for us uh, that may be effective against Liberobacter or at, at least against different bacterial pathogens for their for their educational purposes, we screen them against a number of bacteria. And the whole idea there is we can very rapidly produce a number of these. We can have them um, expressed in plants. They can look at how things are uh, expressed transiently in plants. So we can look at this idea of, of genetic engineering naturally through what agro does. And then we can take um, extracts of these symbionts if we want. We can actually evaluate them right on the plant against pathogens, or we can take extracts and evaluate them in um, on plates using diffusion disks against specific bacteria. And we've set up this protocol in the table below where they screen a, an array of different bacteria. We were just in the process of getting it set up. And one of the first things we learned is uh, agrobacterium is very closely related to CLAS and, and uh, or the, the Candidatus liberobacter asiaticus bacterium that causes greening. And uh, some of the, a lot of the, the ones that we're thinking are gonna be active against, uh, against the superbacter uh, are going to be very active against agro. And our first attempt, we thought we had our gene constructs designed so they wouldn't express in, um, in agro. But as it turns out, we had just enough leaky expression still, uh, even though we had an intron in there, that the ones, ones that we wanted to test, we, couldn't, we could never get them to grow into agro because they were toxic. I guess that's a, that's a good sign. So we've gone back and redesigned our constructs and we're moving forward with that. But it's a really nice module. The students learn a lot of aspects of molecular biology. We have identified some um, antimicrobial peptides that are looking very promising. This is our greenhouse study where we defoliate a plant that, uh, that has citrus greening. This modeling of the leaves is a symptom of greening, and this is a citron uh, plant. And this is a control, and this is one where we have a symbiont expressing the peptide. So we uh, were very encouraged by what we see. 
and we're gearing up to move these to the field for this next year to evaluate. Next. And uh, we actually have been evaluating our symbiont development in general before we've engineered them to produce things that could, could um, have significant effect on, on the, the bacterium. And we don't see any negative effect on the growth. Uh, we've had them in the ground for three years. This is an example. I think you saw this picture already of a symbiont growing. Here's one with a symbiont control. And that's after over a year. Uh, up to this date, we have not seen any negative impact. Um, and again, it's we we have learned that we need to tune the, the genotype by genotype interactions to get the best uh, structure. And now we're looking at developing ways to get these to uh, be delivered in the field in a way that could be adapted for growers to use. Next slide. Okay, so um, symbionts can produce important biological molecules. We've shown that, we're very excited about that. We're tweaking their ability to, to export, to improve their activities. Uh, and um, we can use them to treat plants, induce natural defenses, produce natural defense molecules, protect against bacteria, fungi, insect, or nematode damage is what we're looking to, to evaluate. Uh, but there's other benefits also, like modifying flower and plant growth regulation, improving host plant nutrition or water use efficiency. So we're very excited about the, the, the potential of these symbionts. Next. As I mentioned on one of the earlier slides, one of the steps is to excise the symbionts off the plant and put it into culture to kill off the agrobacterium. And this is a picture of a symbiont expressing um, the fluorescent protein M. cherry. And um, we made a very interesting observation when we remove the symbiont, um, so this is a picture of the agar with the symbiont removed, that there was a footprint of fluorescent protein left behind by the symbiont. And what this showed was that actually the symbiont in on the plate was actively secreting the, the protein of interest. And this opened up the door for us to use symbionts um, in an alternative manner for the, the development of, of novel therapeutics. Um, so we have this sort of broad use potential now, okay? Um, the first that we, we talked to you about was when we, we put a symbiont on the tree, we can, we can deliver therapeutic molecules using that symbiont structure. But with this observation that the symbiont is secreting the therapeutic molecules of interest, we can now, and we have developed the use of symbionts as a production method. And so we can get symbionts to express just about anything, you know, any protein we want. Um, we don't have the, the data here to show you, but we even have used this to produce a COVID-19 nanobody that blocks um, binding with the COVID-19 spike protein and the ACE2 receptor. And so, um, so this is opening up a lot of possibilities for us to use this technology in the development of therapeutics. Um, and um, furthermore, okay, so we have this in vitro system that we'd like to develop where um, you, know, you can have highly controlled production of the therapeutic molecules. This would be good for niche molecules that might be um, difficult to produce in, in animal cell systems or bacterial cell systems um, or for, for, for companies that want plant-based products. Because we can actually get the symbionts to secrete the molecules um, there's, and, and we can keep these cultures of plant cells alive indefinitely, um, there's reduced purification needs. We can get highly pure um, supernatant with the, with the protein of interest. But moreover, um, we could actually get symbionts to produce therapeutic, any sort of therapeutic molecule and then farm those symbionts um, on plants. And this is something that Bob's lab is working to develop down in Fort Pierce. And so if you could now farm symbionts for the production of therapeutics, this has huge potential for reinvigorating rural agriculture and producing therapeutic molecules at a highly reduced cost, essentially the cost of farmings. Um, so this is our current work on molecule production. Um, we currently are producing more than 500 uh, milligrams of, of continuously produced product. Um, from these plant cell cultures. And this is the, you know, sort of concentrated, um, you know, a concentrated tube of the M cherry protein. Um, and this is a snapshot of what we can do in planta. This is a sunflower inflorescence. You can see this is sort of the normal inflorescence. And when we inoculate it with the symbiont, these sunflower inflorescences become huge. And, um, you know, sort of making a cross section, you could see that the inflorescence here is expressing 
um, GFP, M cherry, and also the um, a small molecule called Ruby. Um, you can notice that the the expression is sort of sectored a little bit here. One of the areas of research we're developing is to make the expression more uniform throughout the symbiont tissue. Here's a picture of these symbionts being farmed on citrus, um, producing. You can see these red patches here. Um, where the symbiont is producing that small molecule ruby. All right, so ongoing research, as we alluded to, um, before we can release this technology to growers, we need to optimize the export of the symbiont from, uh, uh, optimize the export of the therapy from the symbiont to the tree. We're developing lines of research to identify the best candidates that would target the citrus greening disease bacterium. And we're working with regulatory agencies to make sure we have um, the minimal hurdles uh, to get this technology out to the growers. And so with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge our CRADA partner in this research, AgriSource, um, a couple of different programs through ARS, the ARSX uh, program in 2020, which helped to fund this research, the grand challenges in ARS, which helped to actually launch the team of scientists. We are here, Bob and I, talking on behalf of a very large team, interdisciplinary team, with locate ARS locations throughout the United States um, working on this now. And of course, a new $15 million grant from USDA NIFA. So with that, um, thank you. And I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but we can maybe pick it up in the discussion later. Okay, well, thank you both very much. Uh, pretty exciting uh, research for sure. and Innovations in both delivery systems and identifying new peptides with potential um, applications beyond citrus screening into lots of areas. So we, we won't have time for questions right this minute, but we will hold those to our discussion period. And reminder to our attendees, please um, go to the Q&A uh, bar uh, in your screen and uh, queue up your questions for, for later. So uh, let's move into our, uh, our last panel, which is actually one individual. And uh, the topic is probiotics, phytogenetics, egg yolk antibodies, antimicrobial peptides, and novel gut met uh, metabolites to improve gut health and host immunity. Dr. Zhang Sheng Yun uh, Sun Lilahoi is a senior research microbiologist and immunologist at the ARS, uh, at ARS, works in immunology and genomics in the fields of poultry. She is in Beltsville, Maryland. Dr. Lily Hoy received her PhD in immunology from Wayne State University School of Medicine, was on the staff at the Laboratory of Immunology and NIAD and NIH. She joined ARS in 1984. Her research is focused on avian immune system and its response to intestinal infections, coccidiosis, and chronic enteritis. Her research has led to the development of safe, effective antibiotic-free approaches to control these two economically important poultry diseases. Among her most important accomplishments are the development and commercialization of not novel diagnostic uh, and uh, antibiotic alternatives. She has uh, received notable awards and recognitions, most notably the American Service Medal for Career Achievement, uh, which is the highest award given to federal government workers and uh, Dr. Lily Hoy is in, was inducted into the ARS Hall of Fame in 2014. So um, a wonderful research uh, background, Dr. Lily Hoy, congratulations on all those contributions. We certainly look forward to uh, your discussion. So I'll turn it over to you. So I, I'm going to start a little bit about my background. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ronnie King. Um, in 1984, uh, this silent global pandemic that Dr. Ronnie King talked about earlier, and the next global pandemic that, as you know, many news agencies are getting public's attention, changed my career path. When I was asked to come for a research opportunity at Batchville Agricultural Research Center by Dr. Michael Rupp, who was the research leader then. You see, I was happily involved in mouse immunology research at the NIAID, National Institute of Allergy and uh, Infectious Diseases at NIH. And Mike said that ARS needs, desperately needs my research expertise to solve a chicken problem. Now that chicken problem is that 
there is not a single antibiotics being developed for this devastating disease that called coccidiosis, caused by multiple strain of uh, epicomplex or intracellular parasite that attacks intestine of chickens. That was in 1984. Nothing really changed in 2022. We still don't have any antibiotics that being developed for these diseases. And that, I think that Mike told me that maybe I can come back, I come to uh, ARS and develop all this technology. And at the time, being very ignorant about this poultry problem, I said, sure, I can do that in a year. Now this is 38 years later. I can tell you, I probably need another 30 years to go. So without uh, talking too much about my background, I'm gonna talk about what has been done last 38 years. And I titled my talk include many different strategies that's been successfully patented and licensed and commercially being utilized so that uh, some of these technology are already in the field and we have many more new technologies that are being developed. Next, please. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time, but we know that there is a discovery void and that is true for many human medicine as well as animal uh, medications. But there are technologies that we can use based on fundamental research that we can transfer to the field that can mitigate mitigate the disease consequences. And that is what I'm gonna be talking about next. So this is what uh, Dr. Mutroni talked about, some of the mitigating strategies that we're gonna discuss. That mitigation really involved developing novel intervention strategy and we call ATA, alternatives to antibiotic to optimize antibiotic use. Next slide, please. So I circle two diseases that we've been working on, coccidiosis caused by multiple strains of intracellular uh, parasites that called coccidia. The other one is that coccidiosis predisposes another clostridium infection called necrotic enteritis, both are very related disease that we're trying to solve. And this was identified many years ago by um, World Health Animal Health Organization. Next slide, please. And the economics has really changed. Coccidiosis is now estimated to cost $13 billion worldwide, whereas necrotic enterprise $6 billion. So we are looking at combined $20 billion. And if we talk to the field veterinarian, if we can control coccidiosis, we don't have to worry about necrotic enteritis. So there's a very close relationship. And I'm going to try to explain to you why that is the case. Next slide, please. Now, before we can develop alternatives to antibiotic, we have to understand how did AGP work then in poultry. Now, in literature, there are a lot of good studies that document some of this mechanism work in humans, in mice. But there's not many mechanistic work, how did AGP work in chickens? But based on some of the literature, we can say, AGP, these antibiotics can be directly microbial. They can reduce subclinical infection, reduce microbial use of nutrient. Also, they reduce growth depressing microbial metabolite, and I'm gonna talk about a little bit of that that we discovered. And they reduce pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. And I'm gonna also show you some of the lesions caused by these pro-inflammatory cytokines. And in human newborn, antibiotic has been associated with obesity. So we know, we talked about all day how it affects not only just animals, but plants and environment. Next slide, please. So coccidiosis, any, the hallmark of this infection is the inflammation. And you can see this gut damage as a result of inflammatory response. That is mitigated by some of the strains that we're gonna use. And if you mitigate the local inflammation and gut damage associated with it, I think that we can uh, promote the growth and preserve the 
the structure of gut. And I think that some of the examples that ATA that we will share with you clearly did that, that uh, uh, reduction of uh, mitigating the inflammatory response. Next slide, please. So I put three different strategies that we have used. On the right panel, we circle color coded. What are the strategies that work for each mitigation strategy? So there's three goals when you talk about this coccidiosis or necrotic enteritis that mainly inflict the gut. Gut health and growth promotion. Naturally, when you damage the gut integrity, you're not gonna absorb nutrition and then it will uh, maybe, uh, it will damage the, uh, reduce the growth promotion. The second aspect of growth of uh, the mitigation is how do we enhance host innate immune response and antimicrobial response? Because chickens survived so many years and we know that they have their own innate immune system. How can we utilize that? But we have to understand how they respond to coccidiosis in a natural infection. Lastly, we want a homeostatic environment for gut microbiota in the intestine. As you know, trillions of bacteria residing in the gut evolve with us. We can manipulate this gut microbiota to work favor for us, reduce the lesion, reduce inflammation, enhance immunity. And many of these compounds that I circle can accomplish that. And I'm gonna give you a little example. Next slide, please. Now, coccidiosis is a very complex disease, and there's not a single recombinant protein out there that can cure this disease. The other thing is because they are now is using live and attenuated parasite to control coccidiosis in the field, they actually drive the evolution against you know, uh, a treatment because they will engender more virulent strains out in the field. So we need to find mitigation strategy that works for the current commercial poultry production. And this review that we recently wrote lists many of these strategies, hypoimmune IGY, probiotics, prebiotics, and some of the vaccine strategies that we're gonna talk about. Next slide, please. So mitigation, first I wanna talk about gut health and growth promotion. Next slide. We heard the term gut health, and this is very important in human health. And I myself take many supplements to make sure that I have good gut health. What about animals? We can put many of these ingredients that we know that promote uh, gut health scientifically to promote the, uh, not only human, but in animal state of physical and mental well-being in the absence of GI complaint. As you know, dysbiosis is a really well-known phenomenon to make the GI have a problem. Nutrient, many of the nutrient can establish that too. So next slide, please. Now I'm gonna talk about phytochemicals because we work with companies and there are products out there that actually being used actively uh, to reduce, to mitigate all these aspects of immune response. We know phytochemicals because there's many different categories. We know about polyphenols, wine, as you know, and there are other compounds that are associated with beneficial effect. There are many papers that are being published every year and that's increasing. So just, just give you briefly, what are the major function of different phytochemicals? Like carotenoids, polyphenol, they're antioxidant. They stimulate innate immunity. They enhance memory response so you can use as a as one for the vaccination. They secrete, stimulate enzymes indoor from cabbage. And we will talk about that a little bit. Antibacterial, they can actually kill garlic, allicin, or some other phytochemicals we found out that they can acti actively kill clostridium and coccidia at high doses. They can promote beneficial bacterial growth. They can actually normalize the dysbiotic state to uh, put them bad health in an homeostatic environment. So they have also like soy has a hormonal activity and they can also block physically when the molecule mimic the receptors. They serve as signal transduction system because many of these phytochemicals bind to identify distinct receptors present in the gut. Next slide, please. 
As you know, malaria, which we know that a lot of human death and suffering associated with this disease. In 2015, Nobel Prize winning winner, Dr. Yu Yu Tu discovered artemisinin, which is a phytochemical, can be an anti-parasitic therapist. This is very encouraging because we know a simple chemical can actually use to treat a parasite. And I'm gonna tell you that many of the uh, ones that we discovered that we can use against coccidiosis. Next slide, please. So this is the strategy we use. Okay, goal is make sure we target some of this pathogen directly. And we also make sure that we can preserve the integrity of gut. So we have a chicken intestinal epithelial cells. We have two muscle cells, primary as well as established muscle cells, because we do want to promote the growth. And we do want this alternative antibiotic to stimulate the growth of this, to, to preserve the integrity of immunity and also uh, the barrier function, reduce the inflammatory response because that will also enhance gut health. We probably screen more than 50 well-established phytochemicals in cooperation with McCormick chemicals that actually manufacture a lot of our spice that we consume. Based on this kind of screening assay, you can see that we can select, depends on what is our goal. Do we want antimicrobial activity or do we want muscle growth? You can pick the phytochemicals and we put together and we go to in vivo testing. In fact, we generate many phytochemical combinations that actually been used to control coccidiosis, necrotic enteritis. Next slide, please. This is an example. This was the first uh, European uh, EPSA approved product that is widely used worldwide. It was uh, established about several years ago. And that is the combination of uh, cabacrol, uh, capsicum, and curcumin or acetaldehyde. Those combinations at very low dose, we're talking about 5 ppm, 2 ppm, so that it will be cost effective. When you feed the birds with this combination, and then you challenge with coccidiosis to see, can we uh, prevent this disease? You can see that here, one of the example, we have numerous examples with different chemical combination, but you can see that compared to infected animal, this yellow bars tells you some of these phytochemicals can clearly enhance, mitigate the body weight loss associated with coccidiosis. On the right panel, you see that some of these pro-inflammatory cytokines those innate immune response that occurs immediately after invasion of parasite can be also mitigated by these kind of chemicals. Next slide, please. This is another phytochemical combination. We recently worked with McCormick Foundation. We found out that three chemicals that were well known, for example, cinnamon oil, green tea, black tea, I actually drink green tea and black tea combination since I found out how good it is. When you feed the chickens from the birds for two weeks and then you challenge with coccidiosis, you can see on the right below in the table, growth is enhanced. We know that we can mitigate all this production. Also the gut has, so that we can prove by, based on what we find in, in vitro, we can translate that in vivo, and these combinations are being formulated right now by the company to treat, uh, to, to for poultry uh, commercial application. Next slide, please. So the mitigation strategy for host immunity and antimicrobial response is another uh, goal of ours. And we have successfully identified hyperimmune IgY or vaccine strategy. Well, we identify the very peptide that chicken uh, evolved to, for chickens to use against this parasite. And that is being licensed. The technology was just licensed. Well, hyperimmune IgY technology was just licensed. And both of these, I believe, will mitigate the coccidiosis response. Next slide. So I mentioned this hyperimmune IgY host defense vaccine are three strategies that we want to mitigate by enhancing immunity and by enhancing production of antimicrobial peptide. Next slide, please. So recombinant vaccine has been tried us since 30 years ago, 
by many of people. And so far, we do not have any commercial recombinant vaccine. You can imagine this parasite that can encode 3000 plus protein. If we just try to solve that with one single recombinant antigen, there's gonna be an issue. Now, what we try to do now here, we want to identify what are some of the antigens that are expressed in all Imeria, whether they mutate or not, we want to have this antigen that are conserved. Not only that, most of these conserved antigen are also conserved in epicomplex and malaria, neospora, cryptospora. So we were looking for some of this very conserved antigen that someday maybe we can use in cryptosporidia or in malaria. One of those such antigens we found was elongation factor. And Dr. Young Sun Lee has been working under, we have a, a NIFA grant, that's a $10 million grant that we are a partner. And we found that in fact, when we use a single protein, in addition to that, we use IR7, which promote T cell growth. T cell is critical component of cell media immunity to this pathogen because these are intercellular pathogen. You have to enhance cell mediated immunity, not antibody response because antibody cannot get into cell. By using this kind of technology, we found that indeed, when we boost the immune response by single antigen, adding some adjuvants such as IR7, CNK2, we can boost that immune response. And this is work ongoing. We just published the result and we are, uh, have other plans to continue with this work. Next slide, please. The other technology that was just licensed, we worked on this last 10 years, is have mother hen produce their own antibodies for their offspring. This happens in nature. So we try to figure out what are some of the target antigens that we can immunize hen. Each hen produce 350 eggs per year. If we can harvest those egg yolk antibodies, make a powder, put it into pellet, it's very safe not in the pellet, in the feed mixture. It's very safe. And also it's a high protein source. In fact, some of this strategy using target antigens have worked so well against coccidiosis and necrotic enterites. They've been tried in the field trial and they work so well. And I think that this is gonna be probably uh, used by commercial companies. Next slide, please. Now we heard about some of the naturally occurring antimicrobial peptide plants has it and insects has it. This is a highly evolutionary conserved peptide. We found in chicken in 2005 by randomly sequencing expressed genes in the gut, infected parasite. We found many of these peptide that we call NK lysine, the antimicrobial peptide. When we clone the gene, when we put it into the sporozoid, as you can see on the right side, they form the pores and kill parasite. Now, when we actually put this ankylosin inside of the chicken, we also find out in scientific report paper, they can turn, reduce the inflammatory response. So you can accomplish both goals using one molecule. And this is something that evolved with the chicken. Thank you. I mean, next slide, please. So in a recent study uh, done by Samiru, uh, Dr. Samiru uh, Wikramasura, and he, uh, and col uh, we collaborated with the company and this was a uh, licensed technology that we use Bacillus subtilis, which is a very safe and, and a lot of companies use as a probiotic, as a spores, easy to pellet and their temperature uh, resistant. So the company and we work together, put our NK lysine gene into the Bacillus subtilis we fed in the feed mixture, and then we challenged. But we know that it can reduce inflammatory response, it can reduce ulcer production, and it also uh, mitigate the body weight loss. So this is one of other technology that we continue to improve because we have some of the issues that we found that we need to solve. Next slide, please. Oh, the other thing is that this technology also, oh, there was a dysbiosis associated with coccidiosis in the control animal, but when we feed bacillus with CNK2, that we, we actually return it to the normal homeostatic states. So next slide, please. So the last 
strategy deals with gut microbiota homeostasis. We know how important a gut microbiota is. It affects some of this allergic response in children. We know that obesity is also associated with some of the dysbiotic state. The AGP, in fact, causes dysbiosis, and uh, we know that uh, as a result of some of this hypersensitivity that associated in human, uh, we know that's associated with that. So the two of stretch, uh, the mitigation strategy that we used was probiotics and phytogenics, and this involves small molecular weight metabolites, and I want to talk about that. Next slide, please. This work is carried out by Dr. Ingyung Park in my laboratory. And, and this started many, many uh, years ago where we work with Amen Hammer Group. They have many of these bacillus subtilis field strain that we screen, more than 40 strain. We identify sensitive strain, one of them, 1781, really acts like antibiotic growth promoter. And we didn't know what the mechanism behind that. And we thought maybe there are some small molecular metabolite as a result of this probiotic that can communicate to the host and communicate and influence physiological response that can grow them better. And this is exactly what we did. Next slide, please. So we did metabolomic using this Bacillus 1781 that we call a bacillus growth promoter. And then we did a metabolite analysis using metabolomic. We identified, we, we saw many, many metabolites, more than 400. Based on uh, you know, the further analysis, we chose 40 of them. Next slide, please. And we use the in vitro screening technology, as I mentioned earlier, using different cell line. And we chose uh, four metabolites to further study because this is really involved enormous amount of work. Next slide, please. And one of them is indoor. Indoor is very abundant in broccoli, uh, Brussels sprouts, and cauliflower. And we heard many times indoor is good for you. Uh, it's anti-cancer. And now I, I can add that that's uh, really good for coccidiosis. And we have published this paper. I'm not going to go into detail, but in vitro studies demonstrate, it, in fact, it can affect uh, the immunity, the balance of regulatory T cells and upper T cells to control the inflammatory response. And it can also uh, reduce the uh, enhanced general gut health. Next slide. So we actually fed chickens with indole and then we challenged them with coccidiosis and we have seen many beneficial effects. So the mitigation strategy against necrotic enteritis is kind of complex because it involves more than just parasite destroying gut tissue. It involves some of the major toxins called NEP. How can we mitigate that response mediated mediate by gut toxin? We work with Mnon company develop a barium complex, which include clay, which is a naturally uh, used to absorb some of the toxin. Was aplatoxin, for example, we tested against our toxins associated with necrotic enteritis. It absorbed the major toxin net B. So we combined that and produced a product that not only enhances innate immunity, it can remove the toxin, it can enhance gut health. Next slide, please. So I think it's, this slide is very important. As we moving forward with many of the potential antibiotic alternatives, when we talk to veterinarians and uh, people involved in developing this product, they don't know which one to choose because every farm condition is different. Not only that, you have to talk about the safety issue, efficacy, does it work with combination with other compound they are using? What about accessibility of the product? How stable is it? How practical is it? So we get all this discussion and there was a workshop in 2019 and published this paper, what are some of the strategic priorities? And I think that every time I get a call from uh, field people, I refer to this paper because it addressed many different aspects. And there's not a single product that will fit uh, uh, one farm because each farm is unique. There's also genetic lines difference, the adverb different, the, the, the response is different, and the feasibility of making this to, to feed to 9 billion chickens, and that's another issue. So there are a lot of things, although fundamental uh, information we have, 
to actually bring this field of many more hurdles that we have to cross. And I think working with different commercial companies really enhanced our understanding. And I think that we are here to help them because there are many questions that we still need to address. Thank you. Dr. Lily Hoy, thank you very much. Uh, certainly an uh, impressive amount of work and progress. And we really appreciate your research efforts. So I think right now, um, let's uh, hold our questions until after our break. So uh, let's take about um, eight, eight minute break. Uh, let's come back uh, maybe a little bit before 10 after the hour. And then we'll devote our time to discussions and questions and answers with all of our presenters. So as we're getting ready to do this, why please go ahead and queue up your uh, questions and answers so that we can get those ready um, for our discussion period. So uh, you might just uh, leave your screens on and, and mute them and, uh, and then come back in, uh, in about eight minutes and we'll get started on the discussion. Thanks very much. Okay, I think we're about ready to, uh, to restart our discussion period. So if um, folks would uh, re-engage, we'd go ahead and get started. Okay, so we'll try to involve uh, all of you because uh, there's a lot of questions that um, you know that have come up. So maybe for uh, Dr. Hart Cooper and Wilson Welder, um, these biocides uh, are they targeted or are they non-specific? And um, would they kill beneficial microbes in addition to the harmful ones that we're targeting? Um, I'll, I'll jump in first, and, and Dr. Wilson Walder can chime in after uh, with anything she wants to add. Uh, the ones that we developed here, uh, because of the problem that we were initially tasked with, making a broad spectrum preservative, disinfectant, and, and wound healing treatment, they, they're broad spectrum. They eliminate everything, not only bacteria, but yeast and mold too. Um, that isn't so. So there is the risk that they would probably harm beneficial bacteria as well. They're that category of tool. Um, that isn't to say that you can't develop ones that are more tailored and specific to certain pathogens, um, but our initial focus was to develop something that just is going to work and eliminate all problematic microbes, allow um, the wound to heal. I, I agree with that. I'm, at, at a given concentration, there isn't anything that these haven't been able to kill. Um, they're, they're just the... <laughs> The grenade in the room, they, they, they take out everything, um, again, at, at given concentrations. Um, so I think, you know, you, you have to be very judicious about how and where you apply them. The, the benefit of them being so broad spectrum is, is their lack of persistence. And so you can apply them for a short period of time and then wash them off or remove them and, uh, allow that skin to recover um, but with you know once you dump that foot bath into your slurry tank or you know wash it down the drain uh, they're not going to persist and continue to cause harm so, so again with, uh, with both of you what's the what's the best mechanism to deliver this is it going to be in foot baths or is it going to be as you pointed out in bombs or you know, as this goes into a commercialization phase, perhaps, uh, how will it be used uh, most effectively? Delivered, if you will. I think that's gonna depend on our, our um, you know, our commercial partners and, and uh, because everything goes to the application and, you know, our producers and, and talking to them, you know, we know for 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 dairies, you know, foot baths work very well, uh, you know, cows, Twice a day, go so you just put it in their way and they'll walk through it. Um, you know, beef cattle, it's a, it's a little bit different, and you know, maybe something that we need as a as a spray as part of an onboarding system. Uh, you know, we chose the 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 bomb treatment because that worked well with my particular model for proof of concept. But you know, something somebody can spray spray in a milking parlor may be the best option. You know, because that is going to allow the most people to to be able to treat that um, you know as they see it uh, probably we're going to have a variety of different applica applications for the producer 
Great. So for um, Dr. Heck and Dr. Shatter, so I'm, I'm looking on the questions that have came come through from our um, participants. Um, and, and one of them uh, from John Bennett talked about it. Do you think it's easier to control the bacteria in the trees or rather in, in the insect vector? So as he points out that mosquitoes are successfully controlled by releasing sterile males with, with CRISPR uh, derived gene drives. So um, where's the best focus do you think and what's easier to control the bacteria in the trees or actually uh, to focus on the, on the vectors? Yeah, thanks so much for that question. Boy, this just plays right into the meat of what we do. Um, so I think um, neither one is, is necessarily easier. In the tree, the bacteria, can, you know, if you can deliver a strategy that reduces the bacterial titer in the, in the tree part, you know, the bacteria may still persist in the roots and then come back and infect the rest of the tree later. Um, and, and sort of anything that would target the insect would have to be delivered through the tree. And so, you know, there's, there's challenges to, to both strategies. However, for the, the, you know, ultimate disease control strategy, targeting the insect vector is, would be the gold standard because by developing treatments that are, are prophylactically preventing transmission, if you get an infected tree, you would prevent the spread of the bacterium through the grove and the development of infected insect populations. So, so that is sort of what, what my lab sort of long-term goal is to achieve here. Um, with regards to the second point, the CRISPR derived gene drives, um, there have been a couple of reports not published of labs successfully using CRISPR uh, to, to modify the Asian citrusillid, but the Asian citrusillid is not a model organism in terms of gene editing yet. And so, you know, while the strategy may be feasible for highly technical, you know, labs to do in the lab as a strategy to, to manipulate the vector populations in the field, we're not there yet. That said, our lab um, has shown that natural non-vector populations exist in nature. So there are insect, you know, um, individuals within the species, a diaphragma citri, that can spend their entire life cycle on an infected tree and not become competent to transmit. And so one of the strategies my lab is looking at is to see if we can use these natural non-vector populations locally to um, you know, sort of uh, replace the vector competent populations coupled with an insecticide treatment and then a release of, of the non-vector males that would be able to do that. And that's something that we're interested in pursuing. Um, but yeah, the technology with CRISPR-Cas9 is not there yet. I guess one short corollary to that is for CRISPR-Cas9 to work too, you would have to identify the genes that would either block transmission or, or you know, create that um, selection pressure for that gene drive to spread in the population. And that's also still research that's ongoing. Great. Again, for you and uh, Dr. Chatters, um, how do you envision direct delivery to trees in a production setting? So, um, you know, how are we going to get this into, you know, large uh, um, crops and, in, in, you know, in, in large geographic areas? Yeah, thanks. Um, I just want to mention for the folks on here. So Dr. Shatters is actually moving to France in the next couple of days. And so the movers, he texted me, the movers have arrived at his house. So he may, he may be in and out of the of the Q&A session here. Um, and, and so, you know, in terms of delivery, that would be specific to the cropping system that we're looking at. Um, for citrus in Florida, right now, the, the growers are indicating that they're willing to put an, ind an individual device on every tree for delivery of, you know, commercially available antibiotics, um, strepto, um, oxytetracycline and so on. And so um, with that level of interest, we do want to capitalize on you know, the fact that the growers are going to go to extraordinary lengths to treat every tree and, and um, leverage that for the, the use of, of the, the, the symbiont expressed antimicrobial peptides to be delivered in that manner via direct delivery. Ultimately, it would be the goal is to get a symbiont growing on every tree 
that expresses these antimicrobial peptides. Um, and the symbionts could be engineered to express a range of different insecticidal, antifungal, antimicrobial peptides uh, that, that could be um, expressed using an inducible promoter. So the grower could then you know, go through and spray the symbionts with, with the inducer that turns on whatever peptide treatment they want to activate during the growing season. And so, um, you know, this technology is still an early stage, but that's sort of the, the long-term vision to how we would develop that. So maybe just to follow up on that, Dr. Hick, um, how long do these symbionts actually last? And does the, the trees actually impart a, um, a, a resistance that's the lifetime of the tree to have to keep doing this uh, through each production cycle? Yeah, those are excellent questions. So the longevity of the symbiont depends on the, the gene by gene interactions with the strain of agrobacterium used and also the genotype of the tree. And uh, Dr. Jim Thompson at the USDA ARS in Albany has been doing some experiments to look at um, ways to optimize symbiont longevity. Um, he has examples and we have examples of symbionts living on trees for more than a year. And so, uh, you know, at least in the greenhouse and in, in the, the, the Pico's farm, um, we can get symbionts, you know, nicely living on the trees for over a year. And in terms of the persistence of the molecules, um, the symbionts that we have in the greenhouse continually express these molecules for the life of the symbiont. Um, you know, the delivery of the molecule from the symbiont to the tree, that's all part of the research that we're doing now. Can it continually export that um, for the life of the symbiont? We don't know yet. Um, but the, you know, the longevity questions, um, we sort of do have some tantalizing data that we can get them to harmoniously live with the trees um, for more than a year at this point. Great. Uh, Dr. Lederhoy, um was really interested in your work in phytochemicals. Uh, does the extensive use of phytochemicals um, as feed additives induce host resistance to them? Yes, in fact, I talked about uh, Dr. Yu's uh, artemisinin, and that is true. It happens. I believe, though, in in poultry, a lot of this uh, usage is short lived for. For broilers, you only want to feed them until they go to market. And as I said, because of the cost uh, concerns that they use very low doses, because these phytochemicals, we're not just grinding up leaves and give them. There's a you know, very um, biochemical process that they go through these companies to make them a product and save. So that it's very expensive. It's very expensive. So. That's why they use this combination at PPM level, which is uh, economically feasible because they are using it extensively. So far, because the short life of, you know, that we use this, we haven't heard of resistance developing. I think we have more benefit by using it than not using it. And because this poultry production season is not that long. So it hasn't been a problem, but it can occur. Dr. Lilyhoy, I had a question for you, or just a, a comment I wanted to make. Um, your talk was really fascinating, and I wanted to let you know one area that we've been experimenting with our symbionts is to, you know, so in, in a lot of plant genomes are encoded very complex biochemical pathways, as you know, to make these um, secondary compounds that could have beneficial effects. And one of them you mentioned is artemisinin. And um, our group has started to look at whether we could make symbionts out of the, you know, from these plants and get them to produce these secondary compounds in culture. And we do have symbionts on Artemisia annua, which is the plant that produces artemisinin. Um, and, um, and so we'd love to talk with you um, after this about ways in which we could send you symbiont culture to test um, and evaluate in, in some of the screening assays that you do in your laboratory. Yeah, I found that very fascinating and definitely uh, we can talk. Great. Okay, so just uh, this morning, we now have a new collaboration for a research project that's, <laughs> that just emerged. So uh, uh, that, that's great. 
we had a question then from our uh, audience, uh, and I'm, I'm going to go back to our um, initial group that's, uh, that, uh, and, and this is the Jennifer and Billy. Uh, is there any information on the breakdown under UV light or oxygen uh, for this product? So I'm thinking about anoxic versus oxygen rich environments. So surface versus greater depth, air, light, soils, et cetera. It's a great question. Um, I don't have much um, results ready for the UV. Um, I think that's a really good idea. It's something um, that we'll look into the effect of, of UV levels on, on degradation and potentially other degradation products. That's a really common thing with like UV absorbers like sunscreens. And because this compound has an aromatic ring, it is gonna absorb some UV um, at sort of the, the short wavelength, high energy region. So it's, it's definitely possible. Um, very good question. Um, and uh, this was the second part around uh, breakdown products under high yeah. oxygen, low oxygen. So sure. for sure you need oxygen. Um, to go through the pathway of degradation for human aldehyde that we've observed because we're seeing CO2 as a quantitative byproduct um, or final product. That means it's the fully oxidized form of carbon. Oxygen has to be going in to be breaking that down, we believe. Um, and, and the conditions we did those tests in um, involved uh, aeration of the liquid media. Uh, so we think that one's very important. Amino guanidine's uh, a bit of a different question. We we The mechanism of breakdown is not fully understood for that compound. Still something we're looking into. Um, we don't see a lot of CO2 being evolved, but that's also because the, the carbon atom that's in that molecule is already of the same oxidation state. So it could be forming something like bicarbonate. And, and so the CO2 would be silent. We do see it go away. We don't know exactly what the products are. I, I think it's likely that it's some mixture of ammonia and nitrate. Dr. Wilson, Welder, any other comments? No, no, it's just kind of interesting. It's like as we, you know, a lot of uh, manure digesters go through anaerobic digestion. And so this is something we're going to have to be concerned about. But I think the, the amount that we're going to end up using actually, you know, if even if we were to dry cow treat every cow on a dairy, the amount I think is still going to be so minimal into that final slurry it's probably negligible, but. It's, yeah, it's a good question. Um, also very, very testable. We can run the anaerobic tests and, and sort, sort it through. Um, and one advantage of the dissociation mechanism is that it's driven apart by water. So as long as it's diluted in water, it doesn't matter if it's aerobic or anaerobic, the first step will occur. Great, thank you. All right, another uh, question from our, um, from our audience. So uh, Dr. Heck, this would be for you. Um, what may be the easiest way to deliver peptides effectively to trees or to insects? Do trees uptake peptides more effectively through foliage or by vasculature via roots or root associated microbes? And have you tested this? So the delivery of peptides to the tree for treatment of citrus greening and other vascular plant diseases is the single biggest challenge in delivering the treatments. And that's where our symbiont technology was motivated um, from that challenge uh, by the symbiont expressing those peptides and then those peptides being exported to the tree into the vascular system we hypothesize that this method is going to be highly targeted and highly effective um, in delivering these therapeutic peptides. There are other ways in which people have been doing this, um, you know, including laser etching the leaf and application of the peptides. Um, Dr. Shatter's lab has been developing adjuvants that would um, facilitate uptake of peptides through the leaf or through the roots. Um, and, and even if you can get uptake efficiently via these other methods, the limitation really is synthesizing these peptides at the scale in which you would need to treat the acreage of citrus in the state of Florida. And so um, the symbiont strategy saves on both the production and the, the targeted delivery to the vascular tissue. Um, and I see Bob is on uh, now, Bob was able to join. So, uh, if you have anything to add to that, please go ahead. No, I think you, I think you covered most of it really well. Thanks, Michelle. Um, 
Yeah, that's that has been uh, what really drove what we did, just as you said. And I think there are there are a number of strategies that uh, researchers are looking at now to deliver things directly into uh, into plants. Uh, they've been, I mean, clearly there's been some methods out there, some injection methods, uh, but none of those are. They've been out for a long time, but none of those are really suitable for like you know thirty thousand acres of citrus. Um, they just the time per tree, the cost, et cetera, just isn't doable. And there is an area that is an area of research that a number of people, especially with University of Florida and some private companies and some things that we're doing that people are looking at um, how to how to get things taken up by uh, these woody by trees, woody perennials. I will mention that um, there there are a couple of groups looking at the use of plant viruses to deliver peptides and RNAs to the tree. So there are several plant viruses and these plant viruses replicate in the plant vasculature. So they provide that tissue specificity. Um, and there's a couple of these, uh, you know, Bill Dawson at the University of Florida, who's now retired, developed uh, citrus tristeza virus as a tool for, um, you know, functional genomics and delivery of peptides and small RNAs um, into citrus. and. Uh, Dr. Ann Simon at the University of Maryland has a small umber-like virus that is a lot smaller than CTV and, and can successfully deliver small RNAs to, to the tree. Um, but, but there are challenges with the viral delivery as well. Number one, these are also plant pathogens, so they face regulatory hurdles, um, but also getting them into the tree, the actual delivery of those molecules, it, that's still the limiting factor. And, and it's possible that in combination with a symbion, a viral vector would solve the export problem and symbionts can get these viruses to continually express in the tree. Great, thank you. Uh, going back to our um, uh, participants, here was a question that came in online. And Dr. Lidhoy, this may be best for you. Uh, the question is, I noticed a lot of natural compounds as solutions to these AMR disease issues. Is there some aspect that is missed by using a single compound as opposed to the natural seed or plant from that compound? Are we investigating the synergy between identified and unidentified molecules? She goes to give examples. I think companies uh, like to use the multiple compound because as I said, every phytochemical have a different functional aspect that we screen so that by combining, when you look at some complex disease like coccidiosis or necrotic aneurysm, so many things are involved, physiological response, immunity, the nutrient absorption, everything. So that so far the products that we were involved with uh, really use the multiple compound. It's different when you look at malaria, you know, I think some iodine pathway, something you can block and that's different story. With this complex infection where your gut is messed up and your inflammatory cells going any everywhere, uh, your, your oxidative stress is there. I think that, especially as I talked about the cost, the companies in, in Europe, we work a lot with Europe, they really have an elaborate process to purify them so there's no toxicity. They know what they are working with. However, the expense is really enormous. So by combining, at very low level PPM, you can synergy, you use that synergy. And we have found as well when we actually test in vitro. Thank you. And, and maybe one more thing that we know that if you uh, extensively use any phytochemicals, I believe we're gonna see the resistance problem and by combining them, maybe you can mitigate that. I, I mean, I just don't know, but that sounds more logical to me in this case. Great, thank you. So for Dr. Heck and Chatters, um, you talked about, you know, this is this uh, great new innovations and they likely will have broader applications than just citrus screening disease. Have you thought about uh, the, the use of symbionts in row crops? <laughs> yes, we, we, we have. Um, we This is being co-developed with a, a, a creative partner and, a, and there's a realization that if, if they could, if something like that could be adapted to row crops, that'd be great. Um, 
our first iteration of this work, because in Citrus, we want to get it to them as quickly as possible, was looking at saying, okay, uh, um, agrobacterium is a is a considered a plant pathogen. Um, and so we, you know, if we genetically engineer and we say, oh, we're going to go out and inoculate these with this engineered bacterium, it's going to create a bigger hurdle for getting through regulatory approval. So we looked at at bringing the plant, uh, the symbiont tissue, you know, into the lab, get rid of get rid of the bacteria, just culture the plant tissue, and and deliver that. That works very well for for woody perennials, but perhaps it it does complicate delivery. Perhaps in the future, as we as we can manipulate these these uh, with um, uh, we can man manipulate the genome of of agrobacterium, we'll be able to um, get satisfactory uh, approval from regulatory agencies so that we could deliver the bacteria or um, even DNA as we're, as we're evaluating right now, that would be amenable to being able to mechanize it and drive down a row crop and, and create symbionts. And we are looking at that. So, you know, they say necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> um, <laughs> my lab uh, works on potatoes as well. And uh, we hand inoculated a field of potatoes with symbionts this year to evaluate them. And uh, I have a Cornell bioengineering student in my lab. And after his nine hours of inoculation in the field, he went back and <laughs> drew up some schematics to you know, have an auto injecting system um, for the potato inoculations in the future. So I think, yes, yeah, our team is thinking about this and we have a collaboration with some ARS engineers in Dawson, Georgia to help us realize some of these ideas. And uh, it's, it's certainly something to consider. <clears throat> Okay, so I, I'm going to do kind of a round robin now. So I have a couple questions here that maybe I'll have each of you give short responses to. So, so the first one is: um, uh, Do you do you foresee a lot of commercial interest in in these new innovations? And secondly, I think the answer probably is yes, but I'll let you answer: Is what's the potential constraints to further licensing and further regulatory hurdles, and how do you other, overcome those? So maybe some hints for the people listening today. So, so Billy, do you want to start kind of with that and then we'll just go around? Yeah, yeah, we, we definitely have um, interest from different sectors. Um, our, our solution could be a really great new innovation for lots of different sectors. I mentioned home, home cleaning, that's one. Um, topical antibiotics, wound treatment for livestock is another. Uh, so there's, we're, we're kind of in the testing stage. We're, we're a little more early on than maybe some of the other projects. Um, but the, the main hurdle is we need to understand and describe what's happening with these chemicals and identify if there's any potential hazards in order for it to really be widely used and, and registered and regulated, you know, through a regulatory body. So we're working with partners to both, um, you know, provide a reason to believe to see if it's going to work, but to also try to understand that we're, we're continuing to seek funding to better understand what happens does this, if this substance is applied to the skin or a hoof, does it go into the body? Where does it distribute? What are the metabolites? There's almost an infinite number of questions, but um, that's kind of at the stage we're at. Um, and uh, Dr. Wilson Mulder might have other thoughts on that. No, I think Billy kind of summed it up. Uh, I just presented some of this work at a, a lameness conference last week and everybody was, where is this? How can I get it? So uh, it's definitely something everybody <laughs> wants in their hands yesterday. Um, we, we need these these products and these alternatives. And I think Billy hit it on the head, yeah. You know, the next step is to to find out, you know, are those metabolites accumulating in the, the animal? Because even though it's a dairy cow, everything ends up in the food supply. So uh, we need to, to look at some more of those safety hurdles and, uh, you know, finish. We're pretty sure what the mechanism is, but definitely nail that down. And uh, I think that will really help uh, any corporate partners we have get over the regulatory hurdles to get this on market. Dr. Heck, Dr. Chatters. Yeah, great. So um, for sure, we have uh, we were extremely fortunate, Bob and I, to have what's called a CRADA, or um, it's a, it's a special agreement U.S. government employees can have with private companies that facilitates the intellectual pr property protections for the cooperating company. And so this research was done in collaboration with our CRADA partner, Agrisource, and their lead scientist, Dr. Marco Patino. 
Um, and so because of that, we have had, um, you know, we have been extremely fortunate to have their expertise to help us bring this through um, you know, patenting and, and, and licensing and commercialization. And so AgriSource is working on developing a new, stra a new uh, company, Perpetual Peptides, that will launch the products. And so having, having their partnership and their support has enabled Bob and I to focus on the science and, and they're focusing on bringing their expertise in, in industry and regulatory for us to sort of come together and move this train forward. Um, and I would say that the biggest hurdle um, would be just the, the sheer amount of paperwork that one has to do to engage other institutions in doing collaborative research. Um, our Office of Technology Transfer at USDA is incredible. They are responsive. They are on the ball. We have a very close relationship with, with them. Um, uh, but nonetheless, the more partners you engage, the more complex the paperwork becomes and every institution has their own, you know, sort of idea on how these documents should look. And, and so it's uh, the, the challenge has just been sort of, you know, hurting the cats and getting all the signatures. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, you know, but we are moving that forward too. And I would have to say it's, that's a, even though it, it's a challenge, it's sort of a minor challenge in the scope of other, you know, the challenges that a team could face. And it's one that, you know, we feel fortunate to have those challenges because it means we have a lot of people who want to work with us and we're engaging companies and universities and different ARS locations. So um, yeah, that's how I would <laughs> spin it. <laughs> Great. Bob, any other comments, Dr. Shatters? No, I think she she hit it uh, right on on target. That with the the only thing I'll add is, um, you know, in terms of the, the challenges. Uh, even though we we went into this with the idea of of like from my viewpoint, who's been frustrated seeing how difficult it is to get a special, especially for specialty crops, to get um, transgenic varieties, you know, into the pipeline. We, that's why we developed this, and it's still going to have a headache. The, the first generations with the regulatory agencies as they start to get comfortable with our technology. And that's that's something that engaging at the highest level it helped with our national program staff and everybody helping along the way, that's it, it'll, it's easing it, but it's still a, a major challenge that we just have to slog through. Dr. Lodewa, you're kind of uh, have probably the most experience, but be interested in your responses as yeah. well. So I was going to suggest that it's a good idea to engage this regulatory agency from the beginning. And one of the intention of our uh, international symposium on antibiotic alternative, unfortunately, we don't have plant section, but we will try to think about plant people now. Um, really find out what do they want? Because you know I noticed that regulatory agency, people keep changing and you have to start all over. And you're talking about five years for 10 years work. So I know you, you agree with me. So I encourage you to engage with them in the beginning. What are the questions? Because even companies with licensed technology and some of these companies just grab everything and then they, they start thinking about regulatory agency, you know, and that's kind of too late sometimes. So that's my really one main suggestion. That's a good one. So before I just kind of try to sum this up, um, are there any final comments or um, uh, from any of our research or scientists today that you'd like to end with? Any last minute thoughts? Okay, we're gonna let Dr. Chatters get his uh, truck loaded up here. And by the way, Bob, good luck to you and your uh, <laughs> <laughs> in your next uh, next area. Uh, let me just take a couple minutes here to sum this up uh, and, and maybe I'll take a more of a 10,000 foot kind of view of this. Um, this has been uh, a, a fascinating discussion today. Uh, these findings are extraordinary and my congratulations to the researchers and scientists that we've uh, that we've heard from today. But there's kind of five things that have kind of um, uh, come out for me in this in this discussion and listening to you all. Uh, the first was uh, the naturalist John Muir once stated that um, when one tugs on a single thing in nature, he or she finds it's attached to the rest of the world. 
Well, you kind of think about similarly, if you pull on the string of, uh, of AMR, you find that, there, that it's attached to strings of complexities and dynamics and humans, animals, crops, plants, and the environment. So, so it takes a different strategy really to start to understand all these connections and how we kind of attack those. So conducting research and working in human and clinical medicine is necessary, but by itself, it's not sufficient. And we need to elucidate the complexities, the interconnections of AMR. So I think that's where the One Health has emerged here. And if you listen today, you know, we, we see different sectors uh, in uh, certainly in the environments and plants and animals. It certainly has emerged as, as an inappropriate framework to both better understand, I think, the dynamics of ARM, but also to determine where the interventions are going to be the most effective uh, and how we actually can adopt these new approaches in different areas. So uh, what you've heard today was really kind of a One Health framework and looking at different strategies for interventions that I think have been um, uh, re really useful. Secondly, uh, these research results have, I believe, mul have multiple health benefits. We certainly have the benefit of discovery and applying innovations and solutions to animal and plant diseases to help sustain and optimize the, our food systems and reduce food insecurities which has a very significant public health benefit. And while we've talked about uh, plants and animals today and the benefits to, in those domains, there is a benefit to human in, in, uh, health in terms of, of food security going into the future. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the health of food animals, of plants and crops are also improved and the reduction in the use of antimicrobials also reduces environmental contaminations and the transmission of resistant microbes or mobile genetic materials. So this research truly has a multiplier effect for broader dimensions of health. And we shouldn't forget then how important agriculture is to human and public health as we go forward. And today, for me, was a good example. Thirdly, the, the priorities that uh, the five priorities identified by ARS through their earlier workshop support the goals of the National Action Plan. And specifically, these were uh, the research studies that we listened to and heard about today are directly linked to the R&D strategy of the National Action Plan, and that is to accelerate basic and applied research and development, uh, and certainly the creation of other um, therapies, including uh, alternatives to antibiotics, are hugely important, and they deliver to this National Action Plan and are completely linked to that, which is, I think, really important. The work we just heard about uh, also fits into the broad action of, of stewardship. And this is, I think, one of the most important things we can, can actually use. It's probably the cheapest way to actually reduce ARM as we move forward, but it fits nicely into stewardship. So to use antimicrobials only when medically and scientifically indicated, and under strict standards. So stewardship is ultimately about slowing down the emergence of resistant bacteria, preventing the spread of AMR infections. And of course, we heard today uh, tactics and tools where antibiotics aren't even used. And so this really feeds back into important contributions to stewardship. So today's topic about mitigation alternatives to antibiotics have, I think, similar and desired outcomes. In addition, these mitigation tools have a targeted effect, reducing, I think, the negative collateral effect that we see in these broad spectrum antibiotics that are now found uh, in our natural systems in the environment and has such adverse effect to commensal bacteria. So fourthly for me, and shifting to this One Health paradigm, the concept of convergence uh, represents both, and this is in quote, the cause and and the cure for AMR dilemmas. So the rapidly growing human and animal populations and also um, our plants and, and crops are brought together in a 21st century mixing bowl along with this global food system. And AMR transmission is accelerated 
and intensified through global trade, the movements of people, products, animals, and plants, while we see that it's embedded in fractured ecosystems and environment. So this is really an unprecedented and remarkable convergence of many factors over the that have been accelerated over the last 20 years that have created the perfect microbial storm and the backdrop for new emerging infectious diseases of which resistant microbes probably compose, compose about 20 to 25% of all emerging human infectious diseases. So on the other hand, uh, such complex and I think vexing problems at the interface of the One Health domains um, require multi and transdisciplinary teams of researchers and scientists and clinicians to use their respective expertise to collectively uh, form, I think, uh, teams. And today what you've heard was, I think, um, an example of convergent science. Relevant sectors brought together to establish the frameworks that integrate knowledge from many disciplines and create a fundamental change in our mindsets, in our research approaches, and to, be, uh, to respond to today's very contemporary health challenges. So of interest, the National Science Foundation now envisions uh, convergent science as the next revolution in biological sciences. And we just heard good examples today of why ARS researchers are already doing this. So just within today's panels, we had chemists, microbiologists, molecular biologists, vector-borne disease ecologists, immunologists and genomic researchers, a convergence of disparate scientists to accelerate innovation and novel innovations. ARS also works with people in academe and, and certainly in the private sector on teams of convergent science. So I compliment ARS and these scientists for leading by example and committing to the convergence and creating new innovations by bringing in different voices and different expertise to create new alternatives to antibodies. So finally, um, I think uh, when, I, when I really look at, um, at One Health, uh, for me, the, it's really gained a lot of momentum. It certainly has gained a lot of acceptance. We talk about One Health now and uh, in the G7, G20, United Nations, um, and that acceptance is continuing, but I think we've really been lacking in our ability to, opera to operationalize this concept. And so our continued progress will depend on the execution and the implementation of new ideas and approaches. So the studies that were discussed today and presented, I think all have an important element of application. We don't conduct research just because we can, but rather we conduct research in an effort to resolve important societal problems. So these are problems in, in cattle, in, um, in poultry, and certainly in uh, citrus are huge impacts on what we see today in, uh, uh, in, in societal problems. So we, we've heard about biocides, phytochemicals, symbionts, genetic engineering, modulation of the microbiome, immunotherapeutics that hold great promise. And while these benefit us in discovery, the true value I think is in the translation of the work you've heard today to practice and very doable applications. So those are kind of the five kind of threads that I've uh, heard today. And again, my compliments to these outstanding researchers and scientists for the work, not only that they're doing, but they're yet to accomplish. So I wanna thank the planners and the organizers uh, of this webinar. Uh, a special thank to our interpreters. I know how hard that is, and some of us talk faster uh, than others. A uh, special thanks again to our outstanding uh, ARS researchers and scientists, and a special thanks to our Zoom attendees who have uh, participated. Um, we'll consider ourselves adjourned for the morning. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye.